Russia's on the warpath and if successful in Ukraine is unlikely to stop there. Lithuania, with EU support, has shut off the flow of military and economic material to the Russian enclave of Kaliningrad, triggering a threat of invasion by Russia in retaliation. A world away, China flexes its muscles as it threatens the United States and their continued support for Taiwan. Fears of World War III are growing by the day, and the United States is taking them very, very seriously. Before we discuss how the US is preparing for the Third World War, first we need to know what its potential enemies are doing. China has long been preparing for a confrontation with the US as it seeks to become the world's dominant superpower. Currently, China falls short of the qualifications for a global superpower, qualifications which only the US fills at the moment. But with its dizzying economic and military growth, it might be less than a decade before the Chinese Communist Party can project power all over the world. China's preparations for a showdown with the West include dislodging the United States as the most important economic power in the world. It also has safeguards to its own economic interests in the wake of economic warfare versus the US. And to achieve this aim in 2013, it launched the Belt and Road Initiative. This massively ambitious plan included building new land and sea trade routes all over the world to connect China economically with nations all the way from Europe to Africa. To achieve this, the nation has not just invested in its own infrastructure, but in building trade infrastructure in other nations as well. However, China's partnership with host nations is more often than not extremely predatory. They offer economic loans to build massive projects that promise economic prosperity, like seaports and rail yards. However, the terms of those loans often dictate that Chinese companies must be hired to do the construction, leaving few jobs for locals. Interest rates on the debt traps is often so high that a poor third world nation is guaranteed to default. Included in the penalties for defaulting are clauses such as China owning exclusive rights to the infrastructure it builds for terms as long as a century. It is in effect a modern version of soft colonialism. China's plan is to have heavy influence in the trade of goods throughout Asia, the Middle East, and Africa, putting it in a very strong position to dictate geopolitics in its ever-growing sphere of influence. China's next preparation for war with the US includes securing its vulnerable trade routes through the South China Sea and the very valuable oil and natural gas deposits in the region, as well as the remaining rich fishing grounds. This effort began with the construction of artificial islands in 2013, which continued unopposed despite an international ruling by the World Court in The Hague that such island building and claims to economic exclusion zones around them were illegal. Foreign pressure also failed to stop China from stealing claims to oil supplies by neighbors such as Vietnam, or of using its Coast Guard to bully and intimidate the merchant and fishing fleets of other nations out of their own territorial waters. These islands have now become heavily fortified military installations, which include modern missile defenses, runways long enough for long-range attack aircraft, and an ever-growing network of surveillance assets, all geared for one purpose – detect, track, and destroy the US Navy. Further preparations have included the addition of dozens of new ships to the People's Liberation Navy, which is now officially the largest in the world. Recently, China's second aircraft carrier came online, and in a few years will be ready for battle, greatly enhancing the CCP's reach in all the important sea and air domains. With Russia's increased belligerence in Europe, there's a serious concern that the two nations might partner up in an attempt to turn the current US-led world order on its head. Despite China's increasing capabilities, it still does not have the power to defeat the US in a one-on-one -on -one confrontation, and it might hope to split the US attention by partnering with Russia, thus forcing America to choose fighting between China in the Pacific or Russia in Europe. For decades, the United States maintained a policy of fielding a powerful enough military to fight and win two simultaneous wars against near-peer adversaries. However, with China's rapid ascension, this has become officially impossible without bankrupting the US, and thus America has been forced to accept that it may only be able to defeat one near-peer adversary at a time. The question is, how was the US preparing to do that, given the increasing likelihood of China and Russia starting a third world war? First, the situation in the Pacific might seem dire with China's numerically superior navy, but the real measure of naval power is not the number of vessels, but in the number of battle force missiles. These are the number of missiles that both navies can bring to bear against each other. The US maintains around 10,000 missiles versus the PLAN's estimated 2,000. Though those numbers have changed and will continue to change as China fields larger vessels and both navies shift in composition. It's estimated that by 2030, China might have closed the gap in battle force missiles to two-thirds of US capabilities. The US's first line of defense against China is the place that's likely to be ground zero for World War III, Taiwan. The small island democracy broke away from the mainland after the nationalists were expelled by the communists in the aftermath of World War II. Since then, 
The former dictatorship has become a vibrant democracy that has refused to reunify and put themselves under control of the Chinese Communist Party. Securing Taiwan is not just important for the ever-intensifying global clash between authoritarianism and democracy, but also for very important political and economic reasons. Firstly, Taiwan produces around 50% of the world's semiconductors after U.S. companies ceased production at home due to expense. Semiconductors are important for every single gadget in your life. The global economy quite literally runs on them and they've become as valuable as a commodity as gas and oil. China itself produces between 25 and 30 percent of the world's semiconductor supply. So if China were to take Taiwan, it would now be in control of three quarters of the global semiconductor supply. This would allow China to effectively shut down the economy of any nation that disagrees with it by simply barring the sale of semiconductors to it, giving China incredible power to further control global affairs and reducing the West's ability to oppose its authoritarianism. Taiwan is also politically important, as it makes up part of what's known as the First Island Chain. This is a chain of islands that extends from Japan to the Philippines and acts as a very physical barrier to the expansion of Chinese influence in the Pacific. If China were to take Taiwan, it would not just break this carefully orchestrated containment strategy, but allow China to effectively neuter Japan's ability to resist it. With aircraft and ships stationed off Taiwan, China could target Japan's lines of communication and trade routes that cross the Pacific and hem the nation in, forcing it into subservience under threat of economic starvation. If China takes Taiwan, the U.S. commitments to defend the Philippines and Japan would be made much more difficult, if not impossible. To defend Taiwan, the U.S. has inked several deals, selling the nation advanced weapon systems ranging from fighter aircraft to air and missile defenses. U.S. military advisors have worked closely with the Taiwanese counterparts for years to prepare the nation for invasion. Despite threats from China, the flow of U.S. arms to Taiwan continues unabated, and recently U.S. President Joe Biden publicly voiced for the first time an unacknowledged truth in American politics. The United States will come to the defense of Taiwan in case of invasion. This greatly angered China, and the White House press corps was quick to walk the statement back. But what seemed like a political guffaw was likely yet another bit of intrigue meant to further the American strategy of keeping China guessing as to how the U.S. might react to an invasion. If China cannot accurately predict what America will do should it invade Taiwan, it serves to create confusion and doubt amongst Chinese leadership. Should China prepare its economy for a flurry of global sanctions like Russia received after its invasion of Ukraine? Or should China expect American F-18s to swarm the skies over Taiwan and sink their invasion fleet? Strategic ambiguity is a powerful tool, and political theater is an excellent method for creating it. But the U.S. is not planning on fighting a war against China alone. To this end, it has helped increase the capabilities of allies such as Japan and most notably Australia, who recently signed a military cooperation pact between itself, the United States, and the United Kingdom. The pact will not just provide security cooperation between the countries, but also help arm Australia with a fleet of nuclear attack submarines. This is of grave concern to the Chinese, who recently attempted to charm Australia away from its relationship with the U.S., a tactic which ultimately failed. In 10 years' time, China might not have to face off just against the U.S. and British submarines, but Australian submarines also, putting the People's Liberation Navy as well as its all-important sea trade routes at increased risk. China imports most of its oil and gas over its seaborne trade routes, and this is exactly what the U.S. is preparing to target in case of war in order to strangle the Chinese economy. Recently, security meetings between Japan, India, the U.S., and Australia were revived after a pause during President Trump's term. The Quad, as it's informally known, aims to tackle global problems such as global warming, cybersecurity, and ensuring a free and open trade environment in the Pacific. This is a veiled implication of the Quad's discussions on how to best handle China's expansion in the South Pacific. Currently, the Quad has no military commitment to each other, but that might change in the future as President Joe Biden makes the South Pacific and confronting China an area of pressing concern for the U.S. India is the only nation in the Quad without a formal security agreement with the U.S., and it has historically refused to sign on to any security partnerships with any nation. However, that may soon change as tensions between India and China escalate, and it becomes clear that India is not able to win a war against the superior Chinese military on its own. Bringing India into the network of security alliances in the South Pacific would effectively hem China in on all sides, and more importantly put allied ships and planes directly in the path of China's trade routes through the Indian Ocean. But the United States is also taking very material steps to confronting China. War with China would be waged at sea and in the skies, with very little of any action between the People's Liberation Army and the U.S. Army. This will be a war of ships and planes, not of tanks and artillery and the U.S. is preparing accordingly. 
In an attempt to prepare for a confrontation with China in the skies, the US has accelerated the procurement of F-35s and made getting squadrons of the fifth-generation fighter into operational status a top priority. However, both the Navy and the Air Force have expressed reservations about the F-35's current readiness, which has prompted both the services to supplement orders of F-35s with orders of upgraded legacy aircraft, such as the F-15 Eagle for the US Air Force and the F-18 Super Hornet for the US Navy. To counter the threat of Chinese missiles, including its very vast arsenal of ballistic missiles capable of targeting US ships far out at sea, the Navy has also begun to expand the number of Aegis-equipped vessels in its fleet. Starting in 2015, the Navy also began to work on undoing the strategy of carrier-based sea dominance that it's employed since the end of the Cold War. With the fall of the Soviet Union, the US Navy enjoyed unmatched superiority and complete freedom of action anywhere in the world, and thus surface fleets were retasked with simply protecting carriers. Anti-submarine warfare and anti-surface warfare skills had atrophied as naval strategy centered completely around the big carriers. Now the US Navy is preparing its crews to once again face off against near-peer foes in ship-to-ship -ship battles. Submarines are America's second greatest naval asset after aircraft carriers, and yet remain nearly completely forgotten by most of the world, which is exactly how they like it. Currently, the US has a fleet of 68 submarines and is replacing the Cold War Los Angeles-class fast attack submarines with the new Virginia class. Investment in submarines has stalled recently and procurement plans are behind schedule, but the United States retains a significant advantage in undersea combat, despite China having a larger force of less advanced submarines. The realm of hypersonic missiles has received a great deal of attention ever since it was announced that the US was lagging behind both Russia and China in their development. Yet there's some misinformation and confusion regarding this technology that's made Russia and China seem as if they hold a significant advantage over the US in this realm when they really don't. Firstly, any ballistic missile is hypersonic, and China's recent test that saw a hypersonic missile fly around the world is not very impressive from a military point of view. Technically speaking, this simply doesn't add any additional capability that didn't already exist. The real threat from hypersonic missiles comes from maneuverable hypersonics. These are missiles that can not only fly at hypersonic speeds but can also maneuver while doing so, making them incredibly difficult to defend against. In this area, all three nations are still struggling to field fully operational missiles, but the US has made great strides in recent tests. One area where the US may in fact be coming up short is the development of advanced long-range air-to-air missiles. Recent photos of Chinese jets show that China has begun to field advanced beyond visual range missiles, while the US is still largely equipped with the AIM-120, an extremely capable and combat-proven air-to-air missile that nevertheless is only effective at medium ranges. However, the Pentagon's F-3R program aims to improve the capabilities of American air-to-air -air missiles by not just greatly expanding their range, but also improving efficiency in an electronically contested environment. A new generation of American missiles will feature two-way data links, GPS-enhanced inertial measurement units, an expanded no-escape envelope to increase lethality, and improved high-angle off-bore sight capability, allowing pilots to fire missiles without their plane being pointed directly at the enemy, thus lowering their vulnerability. However, the next step for US fighters is the AIM-260, which will feature beyond visual range capabilities and match longer range opposition missiles while bringing the tried and true technologies of the AIM-120. But World War III will also likely involve action against Russia in Europe, as China and Russia are both likely to cooperate in such a scenario. This will be a partnership of opportunity, however, not of choice, as relations between the nations are difficult at best, and Russia grows increasingly frustrated at its status as the junior partner. With Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the Russian military has proven itself incompetent, corrupt, and inept at executing a modern 21st century war. Despite vastly superior firepower, the Russian offensive in Ukraine has all but stalled out. And this is with Russian forces facing a foe that has a fraction of the capabilities of the US military. Simply put, the only real threat Russia can bring to a global war scenario is their nuclear power. With the bulk of the US Army not taking part in operations in the Pacific, Russia would be easily contained by current US ground firepower while NATO would be short on critical air assets. These are capability gaps easily filled in by NATO air forces. Four months ago, we would have spent an additional 10 minutes explaining to you how the US is preparing to counter Russia. Today, after seeing what the Russian military is capable of, we honestly don't have to. While victory would come at a cost, NATO would most likely win a resounding victory over the Russian armed forces. The only real threat Russia would pose 
would be in the first few weeks as the bulk of American firepower is being shipped across the Atlantic and prepared for battle. This leaves the Baltics and Poland vulnerable, but the deployment of NATO Rapid Response Forces would likely be enough to slow down an initial Russian offensive and greatly limit its gains until NATO's European partners can fully mobilize their own armies. U.S. strategy to counter Russian aggression in the next world war is thus based around preparing European partners to better defend their own continent and not be so reliant on the U.S. military, as the conflict against China will consume the bulk of U.S. sea and air power. The Pacific is where the real war will play out, and after its stunning losses in Ukraine, it's unlikely Russia would willingly engage NATO in a third world war anyway. With Russia hogging all the negative press lately, you might have missed Chinese President Xi Jinping's adamant proclamation that Taiwan will be reunited with the mainland. And he is not ruling out military force to accomplish this goal. But with the vast majority of Taiwanese citizens wanting nothing to do with mainland communist China and American President Joe Biden promising that the U.S. would come to Taiwan's aid, World War III is looking more likely and it won't be starting in Europe. How is China going to defeat the U.S. and its allies? And more importantly, why does Taiwan matter so much that the U.S. is willing to fight to keep it free and independent? China wants Taiwan, and the U.S. wants Taiwan to remain free. Both sides have their various reasons, but there are some significant overlaps. For China, Taiwan is both a matter of national prestige and a national defense priority. The island is home to the Chinese nationalists who fled after losing the war against the communists after World War II. And given the difficulty of an invasion plus the support of the United States, reunifying this breakaway province by force has not been an option for China. It's only recently with China's vast modernization of its military and steadily expanding amphibious assault capabilities that the dream of taking over Taiwan is approaching fruition. But as long as Taiwan remains fiercely independent and refuses to bow to Beijing, China cannot be taken seriously as a global military power. After all, why should anyone fear your military when it can't even pacify an island sitting right off your own shores? For the Chinese Communist Party, Taiwan represents an existential threat, though. The nation began as a dictatorship but gradually became a liberal and open democracy. Today, it's amongst the most successful democracies in the world, and that's a big problem for the CCP. As long as Taiwan remains independent, it remains a symbol for the Chinese people of what life could be like for them if they were no longer under the thumb of the CCP. After the extreme measures enacted by President Xi during and after COVID, disillusionment with China's government and the very society it's built around has skyrocketed amongst the youth. To many of them, the democracy lurking right off their own shore is a more appealing choice, and as long as Taiwan remains independent, it'll continue singing its siren song of democracy to the Chinese people. However, there are two very real and very significant strategic reasons for China to want to take Taiwan back and for the U.S. to want it to remain independent. First is a Western strategy known as the First Island Chain. This is a chain of pro-Western friendly nations that ringed the shores of China and Russia both. During the Cold War, it acted as a physical barrier to communist navies in case of war, who would be hemmed in and unable to operate in open waters without being destroyed attempting to break to the open sea. The first island chain also allows friendly navies to operate very close to enemy shores by having resupply and repair facilities readily available and not relying on far-flung bases which would limit loiter time for friendly ships and aircraft. Today, the first island chain strategy no longer hems in the Soviet Union and its allies and instead acts as a barrier to Chinese expansionism. China has attempted to break the first island chain by illegally building artificial islands in the South China Sea, and while the threat they pose is significant, it still doesn't allow the Chinese Navy to break the defenses of the first island chain completely, and it doesn't allow them to push hostile navies far enough away that Chinese shipping can continue to keep the nation supplied with the vital petroleum and natural gas it needs. Another strategic reason to want reunification with Taiwan could potentially impact the entire world, though. Today, Taiwan is the world's largest manufacturer of computer chips and semiconductors. Wielding such significant clout that its embargo of Russia has all but crippled the nation's ability to build modern weapons, Taiwan's contribution to the global technology market is so significant that as the Chinese threat over the island grows, the United States has passed emergency funding for computer chip manufacturing plants to be built inside of America once more. If China were to seize Taiwan, it would in effect be in control of nearly all the world's supply of advanced electronic components and be able to threaten embargoes to nations that don't tow the CCP's line. A nation would have a simple choice, have its economy crippled or do as President Xi says. So how can China achieve its goals even if it means launching World War III and come out on top?
China has already prepared extensively for conflict against the superior U.S. Navy, and has done a really good job of it too. The surface combat ships are still no match for American vessels, with China having approximately two-thirds of the total battle force missiles that the U.S. Navy has. Its air force is similarly outclassed by the U.S. Air Force, which not only outnumbers China's, but has far better capabilities in all but one department, long-range air-to-air missiles where the Chinese PL-15 enjoys a significant advantage over the American AIM-120 in terms of range. However, the US is fast-tracking an upgrade called the AIM-260 Joint Advanced Tactical Missile to not just close the gap, but exceed it once more. US air and naval power won't matter though if it can't bring all that might close to Chinese shores, which is why China has invested heavily into developing a strategy known as Anti-Access Area Denial, or A2AD. The goal is simple, keep American ships and special mission aircraft such as AWACS and tankers away from Chinese shores so the People's Liberation Navy can operate with impunity. At the core of the strategy is the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force, or PLARF. PLARF might sound like something you do after a bad burrito, but it's the gravest threat the US Navy has faced since the end of the Cold War, and it might be good enough to keep the US ships out of the Western Pacific for good. A ballistic missile force, this branch of the Chinese military is dedicated to China's vast stockpile of both nuclear and non-nuclear ballistic missiles. China was never subject to the Intermediate Range Force Treaty, or INF, and thus, unlike the Soviet Union and the US, China developed an extensive stockpile of conventional ballistic missiles. Today, China fields about 1,400 ballistic missiles alongside hundreds of cruise missiles. Most of these are older, shorter-range missiles which we could expect to see deployed against Taiwanese infrastructure. But hundreds have ranges capable of hitting US bases in Japan and South Korea. A small but unknown number can even hit the all-important US base in Guam. The PLARF would be critical in the opening days of World War III. Both the US and China hold serious counterforce power, and the advantage would go to whoever fires first. A war between the two powers would almost certainly be a bolt out of the blue attack, an unexpected first strike using hundreds of ballistic missiles. The targets would be US bases in the region, with a priority target being Guam. However, this comes with certain risk, as striking US bases in Japan and South Korea would threaten dragging those two nations into the conflict. South Korea may be disinclined to join the conflict out of fear of North Korea taking advantage of the situation. In fact, for China to win, it would be in its best interest to proceed a war in the Pacific with ramped up antics from North Korea, enough to rattle South Korea without actually crossing the line over into war. Fears of North Korean aggression would be likely enough to prevent South Korea from doing anything other than voicing public support for its American allies. Japan would be a different story. The two nations are famous rivals, and there's still a lot of bad blood between China and Japan. What's more, Japan agrees with the US that China presents a threat to democracies around the world. Losing a fellow democracy like Taiwan to China could represent a larger global shift toward authoritarianism. China, being the dominant regional power, is also greatly disadvantageous to Japan, whose all-important trade routes pass by close enough to China to be intercepted by its navy should Taiwan fall and the first island chain be broken. Thus, it's almost a foregone conclusion that Japan would join the war anyway, no matter what China ends up doing. The rewriting of its constitution allows the expeditionary deployment of its military, bucking the self-defense pacifist ideology of the past, and it's proof that Japan is actively preparing to send ships, troops, and planes to aid the US and Taiwan. This is a serious problem for China, because Japan provides a convenient staging ground for both US naval and air forces. A significant number of ballistic missiles would have to be dedicated to striking Japanese air bases and harbors in order to deny both to the US military. Chinese military doctrine states that the PLARF is to be used in a swift, precise, and overwhelming strike against an enemy force. This means eliminating the greatest threat to Chinese ambitions in the region, the United States Navy. It's not enough to shut down US bases and airfields. America has a huge expeditionary capability and lots of friends from where they could stage ships and planes. Winning the war in the Pacific means beating the US Navy black and blue. China is counting on the US's public aversion to military casualties to win the war the moment it starts. To achieve it, it needs to score huge losses to the US at the onset of the war in terms of both men and material. That's why US aircraft carrier strike groups are China's number one priority. Not only do American supercarriers threaten all Chinese naval shipping, but the loss of even a single carrier would result in the death of thousands of American sailors. This is something China hopes it can use to shock and awe the American public into not supporting a protracted war. Because China cannot win a long-term conflict against the US, it simply lacks the material and ability to protect its trade overseas, while it can do nothing to threaten American global trade.
With U.S. carriers kept at bay with ballistic missiles and friendly airfields destroyed, China would have a week or two to achieve its objective of capturing Taiwan. However, China faces three critical problems with its war plans. The first is that any invasion of Taiwan would take weeks to coordinate. Ships would have to be restationed to nearby harbors. Hundreds of thousands of troops would have to be moved from various military districts to the eastern one in preparation of boarding. Supplies like food, water, and medicine would have to be gathered in the millions of tons and prepared for shipping across the strait. Hundreds of aircraft would have to be moved to nearby airfields. Basically, an invasion of Taiwan would be anything but a bolt out of the blue. It would be a very publicly broadcast event that would have months of warning. The United States would use this time to gather global support for either painful political and economic measures against China or to build a national military coalition like it did in Desert Storm. In an unprecedented move, European NATO partners have been sending ships to the South Pacific in the last six months. These routine patrols are meant to signal one thing to China, Europe stands with the US and against an invasion of Taiwan. Invading Taiwan would mean taking on an international coalition. And there's no ready answer to this daunting problem for China, who enjoys few meaningful alliances, and zero who would support it in war against what would in effect be a global force. The second problem China faces is that though its ballistic missile force is a deadly threat to US forces, it might not be able to effectively deter US naval operations the way China hopes it will. Hitting a stationary airbase with a ballistic missile from thousands of miles away is relatively easy. China has reduced the circular probability of error from 100 to just 5 or 10 meters for its modern missiles. However, hitting a fast-moving warship in the middle of the ocean is a different challenge altogether. Ballistic missiles and other standoff weapons need good tracking data to hit a moving target. This means that a ship must be first discovered, properly identified, and then finally fixed. China has greatly improved both its ground-based and satellite-based long-range radar capabilities, but this type of radar can only tell you a ship is out there with an approximate distance. Accuracy of satellites, however, is greater, though they provide only a temporary track as they orbit the Earth. In order to properly identify and then provide a good track, you need a much better sensor technology and it's unknown if China can foot the bill there. A vast investment in drones and AWACS aircraft means that China potentially has the tools to get the job done, but these airborne assets have to face the threat of the most capable air force in the world. China does enjoy an advantage here because the US would have to operate aircraft at extremely long ranges. But a decided uptick in both the purchase of air and sea drones by the US military, as well as a new tanker drone, means that the reach of America's weapons is being steadily and greatly increased. Even if China can overcome the difficulties in hitting moving targets, there's still one Achilles heel it has no solution for, neither today nor in the projected future. China depends on overseas trade for the majority of its oil and natural gas imports. It does have two land-based connections to Russia, but one of these, the pipeline from Sakhalin, would make an easy target for a cruise missile strike via submarine. That would leave only one inflow of oil and natural gas in the far west out of US reach. This would basically be a trickle compared to China's current fossil fuel supply, and within weeks the nation would run out of oil altogether. Its military could fight on for a few months at most due to the strategic reserves, but its economy would come crashing to a halt as the civilian sector becomes energy starved. To add insult to injury, over 60% of Chinese trade comes via the ocean. Except it wouldn't in case of war, thanks to the US Navy. Even if its ballistic missile forces are effective at keeping the US Navy at bay, ballistic missiles can't stop the huge US attack submarine fleet. Surface task forces could also easily choke off China at multiple traffic choke points for maritime trade, including the Malacca Straits, the Gulf of Oman, and the Panama Canal. China is attempting to secure ports and airfields outside of the country so it can base forces near these strategically important waterways, but so far has only succeeded in gaining the use of a small base at Djibouti, only miles from a much bigger American base. With the bulk of the world on the US's ideological side and the vast network of friends and partners the US can use to leverage pressure on anyone contemplating allowing China to build military bases on their territory, it's not predicted that China's forward-deployed military forces will grow in any significant amount. The Chinese Navy may be the largest in the world today, but most of these ships are smaller vessels meant to act as missile boats or harass the fishing vessels and oil exploring ships of neighboring nations, not attempting to dislodge a US carrier strike group from a vital trade artery. For all its planning, there's nothing China can do about this situation in the current or even long term, though it is steadily working at building a blue water navy capable of operations far from home shores. It still has a significant way to go to get there, however, and even the US remains firmly in the lead. September 28, 2027, 0, 330 hours local, Wukiu Islands, Taiwan Strait. Local residents are woken by the sound of helicopters, gradually building in intensity until the sound of a dozen Chinese helicopters approaching the local township 
becomes a roaring cacophony growing in intensity. Before any of the assault helicopters come into view, there's flashes of light from ships offshore, and seconds later a whining scream as shells fired by the 130mm cannons of the Type 55 destroyers just sitting off the shore smash into the beaches. The fire is very precise, and multiple defensive emplacements of the Taiwanese XTR-102 air defense guns are destroyed. But other shells hit empty stretches of coastland. The small garrison of Taiwanese Navy personnel responsible for defending the island have already moved them to new positions, leaving dummy guns made out of metal and plywood behind for the Chinese to destroy. The invasion was inevitable. Since the early summer, China had begun building up a massive invasion fleet, an effort taking months to coordinate as the People's Liberation Army Navy gathered the resources necessary for a cross-strait invasion. Hundreds of civilian vessels of all sizes had been pressed into military service to shore up the plan's amphibious capabilities. If an invasion of Taiwan was going to succeed, it needed to happen fast, and every ship that could hold a tank or armored vehicle was soon finding itself under temporary new management. The rain of shells continues as the first wave of the assault aircraft nears the beaches. Chinese Z-10 attack helicopters are the tip of the incoming aerial spear. Their job is to sniff out Taiwanese resistance and destroy it, providing protection for the incoming transport helicopters. Overhead, Chinese flying sharks are providing air defense from any Taiwanese Air Force incursions, though none are expected. The two Wiku Islands are many times further from Taiwan's shores than China's. By the time the Taiwanese planes would reach them, the fighting would be over. From positions obscured by camouflage netting, a steady stream of tracers fires up into the sky and at the Chinese helicopters. The surviving XTR-102 guns have been hidden from Chinese visual and thermal recon by netting interwoven with materials designed to defeat infrared detection. Now the guns glow as hot as the sun as they send steady streams of cannon fire up to the attack helicopters, but it doesn't matter anymore, the time for deception is over. Two Z-10s are smashed out of the sky by the withering fire of the remotely operated weapons. Knowing they'll be outmatched by a superior Chinese force, Taiwan has looked to automation to shore up its defensive capabilities. The computer-controlled sentry guns have been given the freedom to pick their own targets and use a variety of sensors to lock on the attack helicopters. The other Z-10s peel away and go up to gain altitude as the pilots scan for the sources of incoming fire. Twisting down into a steep dive, the choppers unleash a barrage of cannon and rocket fire at the automated guns below. Two more Chinese choppers are shot out of the sky, but eventually the automated guns go silent. The path for the dozen Z-20s, each carrying 15 troops, is open, and minutes later the first of the air assault choppers cross the surf line at just a few feet over the water top height. The helicopters are met by a wall of ground-to-air missiles fired by the Taiwanese defenders on the ground. But under withering fire, the air assault is over in less than an hour. China has seized both Weiqiu Islands in an opening gambit for forced reunification of Taiwan. September 28, 1700 hours local, Washington, D.C. That son of a bitch is daring us. The American president scowled at the TV screen, currently tuned into network news and showing a pre-recorded speech by Xi Jinping, president for life of China. The Chinese president is declaring the start of reunification procedures with the breakaway province of Taiwan. He is purposefully ambiguous about the scope and methods of which China will use to reunify Taiwan, but has declared that in response to the launching of anti-ship missiles from the Weiqiu Islands by Taiwanese forces, his military was forced to defend itself by seizing the islands and neutralizing the threat. It's a fait accompli attack. No different than the same type of attack NATO feared Russia would launch against one of its Baltic neighbors. That scenario, Russia was projected to take a small meaningless chunk of a Baltic nation and then immediately heavily fortify it, daring NATO to respond. If the alliance didn't invoke Article 5 immediately, then its credibility would be ruined, splintering the unifying principle of NATO. But would every member of NATO agree to World War III over some insignificant Lithuanian village? Taiwan enjoyed no such formal treaty. This was easier for China than it would have ever been for Russia. The US had been carefully preparing for a full-blown invasion of Taiwan ever since the buildup of naval forces around the strait at the start of the summer. But would the US go to war with the second most powerful nation on Earth, over two islands with a total population of 400? The American president rubbed his temples vigorously. He picked up his direct line connecting him to the chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff. The words he spoke into that phone would have repercussions for the entire planet. September 28th. 0645 hours local, Fleet Base West, Australia. The sleek Virginia-class submarine spun up to full power as the harbor tugs pulled away. The HMAS Crawford was one of two nuclear-powered submarines built by the Americans and gifted to Australia to tide the nation over until its own nuclear submarine program reached maturity in the mid-2030s. Five minutes later, the black hull was slipping beneath the waves as she steamed away from friendly shores and into harm's way. 
She carried only conventional weapons, 12 Tomahawk cruise missiles, and her two vertical launch systems located about halfway down her spine, and 25 Mark 48 80 CAP torpedoes to launch from her forward tubes. Just one of those torpedoes had a good chance of crippling a Chinese cruiser, two would sink it. Her course was due north, where she joined a wolf pack of American attack submarines north of the Philippines. Her captain and the crew hoped this was merely posturing, but all feared the worst. October 2, 1735 hours local, Ronald Reagan Carrier Strike Group West Pacific classified. The captain of the Ronald Reagan watched the navigation display like a hawk, scarcely taking his eyes off the blue lozenge-shaped digital marker that represented the Reagan and her accompanying escort warships. The American supercarrier represented one of the greatest concentrations of military power on Earth. There were two others like it already in theater. The USS Nimitz was on patrol just east of the Philippines, and the George H.W. Bush had been reassigned to Pacific Command the moment that China began to draw forces for a projected invasion of Taiwan. And its escorts loitered off the Japanese coast on the other side of the Japanese mainland from the USS America. Three carrier strike groups and one expeditionary strike group. Washington was sending a very strong message to Beijing, as the captain watched the blue digital icon of the Reagan approach an elliptical boundary superimposed onto the navigation display. He figured it was time for the Chinese to send their own response. Pixel by pixel, the blue lozenge on the screen slowly neared the brown elliptical boundary that cut across the screen. Zooming the display in so that it now showed the Reagan's position in terms of individual kilometers instead of tens of them, he held his breath as the icon neared the brown boundary at a snail's pace, and then crossed it. Despite himself, he let out a heavy sigh, slightly embarrassed at the noise it caused in the packed CIC. Sure, everyone had been holding their breath, but he was the captain. He was supposed to remain steadfast, not sound like a relieved schoolgirl that, Sir, we're getting priority flash from Eglin. They've got thermal plumes from multiple sites near Alex Azuoki. The junior officer working the ship's highly sophisticated communications gear looked as pale as a ghost. So, China had responded. The captain only hoped he looked a little more composed than his subordinate. He took a moment to compose himself before speaking. This was a shooting war now. Anything from the Hummers? Negative, sir. It's probably not us, but keep them looking. Flank speed, yeoman. The helmsman, a yeoman third class, eye-eyed her confirmation to his order. Despite the massive size of the ship, he swore he could feel it lurch a little bit as the reactor output was increased dramatically and the supercarrier picked up appreciable speed. The top speed of a US supercarrier was classified and the Reagan was now hitting those speeds. Despite being a fraction of her tonnage, the escort vessels would struggle to keep up. The ship would go in a zigzag pattern at flank speed with her escorts doing their best to catch up and remain in formation. The maneuver was meant to throw off incoming ballistic missiles, China's famous carrier killers. But to kill a carrier far out at sea, China needed to be able to detect it first, identify, and then track her. Over-the-horizon radar was good for detecting large ships like the Reagan, and China had come a long way in this capacity in the last 20 years. However, they offered too little in terms of identifying or tracking vessels. The IDing was up to satellites in space, who would easily image the big carrier in both visual and thermal spectrum. Satellites whizzed by too fast for a good track, though, especially given the missile's long flight time from launch to impact. That's why the Chinese had to use other methods to track the Reagan this far out at sea, and the only possible solution was a low, observable, long-range drone. Here, too, China had made great strides. If they didn't find that drone and kill it, the world would finally see just how good the escort's SM-6 fleet ballistic defense missile really were. His combat air patrol was already on the hunt, assisted by two Hummers, E-2 Hawkeye's airborne early warning aircraft. Their powerful radar swept the skies in 360 degrees for hundreds of kilometers around the carrier, able to detect conventional aircraft long before they could even come within range of firing standoff weapons. Low observable or stealthy aircraft, however, were a different matter altogether. The Reagan had been prepared for this possibility and had sent up two combat air patrols, one northwest and one southwest of the carrier. The AESA radars were powerful, better than anything the Chinese had in their fighter inventory, but the Hawkeyes were the real quarterbacks in the sky. Without them, they'd have no chance of finding the drone potentially feeding targeting data to the incoming ballistic missiles. Sir Eglin affirms trajectory. They've got multiple other launches, but this batch is coming for us. The captain swallowed hard. Everyone knew this was a possibility. China could ill afford to allow three American carrier strike groups in its backyard if it was going to take Taiwan, and America had worked for the better part of two decades at defeating the threat that ballistic missiles posed to its fleet. Now it was up to the various links in the chain to do their job and destroy the enemy's own kill chain. He was confident that even now US space assets and cyber warfare units were on the offensive, jamming, disrupting, and even sabotaging Chinese space-based surveillance networks. 
He was confident that the Chinese were doing the same right back at the Americans. The first shots of World War III had been both in the physical and cyber world. Minutes ticked by. The discomforting thoughts of dozens of tons of high explosives hurtling through low orbit straight at his ship weighing heavily on the captain's mind. His aircraft and ships blasted surrounding airspace for hundreds of miles with all matter of electronic noise, trying desperately to find the drone guiding Chinese missiles to their targets. The EM radiation alone was lighting up like a spotlight in the darkness, but it was necessary to spot the stealthy drone. Eagle 2-4 has a bogey at Angels 20, dagger flight already on its heading. The commander of the strike group's air defenses had already confirmed good track on incoming ballistics. The captain checked his watch. They should be breaking back into the atmosphere in a few minutes, with the group's SM-6s being fired in volleys just before to hopefully intercept right inside the atmosphere. It was like hitting a bullet with a bullet. A dicey proposition in the best of conditions. Spotting the Chinese drone and destroying it would greatly improve their odds of survival. 150 miles away and thousands of feet up, four F-35s put on full afterburners as they raced toward the target sent to them by the Hawkeye. Their own radars were only now starting to pick up the bogey track, but they'd have to get closer before they could acquire a targeting solution. Speed was time, and time meant they might have a ship to come back to instead of having to ditch into the Pacific. A minute later, two AIM-120 long-range air-to-air missiles were on their way at supersonic speeds. The drone didn't even bother taking evasive actions. It was blown out of the sky and the critical data link to the incoming ballistic missiles was broken. A few minutes later, the missiles that survived the storm of SM-6s coming up to greet them from below smashed harmlessly into the ocean, missing their targets by a dozen miles. But off the Filipino coast, the Nimitz strike group fared far worse. The shorter flight time meant that it was easier for China to track and target, and despite a vigorous showing from the group's SM-6s, three of her escort vessels were nearly broken in two by tons of high explosives falling out of orbit at hypersonic speeds. The Nimitz itself took a single hit aft of the flight deck, ripping the entire aft section apart and destroying two dozen aircraft in the massive hangar below. The ship's propulsion was seriously damaged, and only one of her screws was operational as she was forced to limp south toward the safety of Australian waters. A Chinese diesel-electric sub would finish her off two days later, at the cost of its own life, from American ASW aircraft. The George H.W. Bush and the America both fared far better, enjoying the robust protection of both their own and American and Japanese shore-based ballistic missile defenses. The batteries of Patriot interceptors would have to choose to defend either the Japanese and American ships or inland airfields. They chose the latter, doing their best to shield the two navies from withering ballistic missile attack over the next two days. Airfields could be repaired, but there was no unsinking a supercarrier and her escorts. Arguably, they were much more useful in the war to come anyway, as it would take place almost solely in the air and in the water. By attacking the American and Japanese airfields, though, China committed Japan to the war. It had been a small gamble. Japan's entry into the First Sino-American War was a foregone conclusion. Japan didn't want China dominating the Western Pacific any more than the Americans or anyone else, really. South Korea had been spared, however, out of fears of dragging them into the conflict as well. In turn, China struck terms with South Korea. It would not attack the nation's military infrastructure as long as it forbade the Americans from using their forces there to launch attacks against China. Faced with the possibility of a Chinese bombardment and invasion from North Korea, South Korea struck a pragmatic if disappointing bargain. October 24th. 1101 local hours, Joint British-American Expeditionary Force, Arabian Sea. The Chinese attack on Diego Garcia had been a complete surprise to the Americans and their British allies, who had thrown themselves wholeheartedly into the war on the side of the Americans. China had managed to slip several long-range ballistic missiles into its naval base at Djibouti, the entire launch assembly miniaturized and disguised as cargo containers. It had only taken hours to move them into position and send a small volley at the joint British-American base on the small atoll of Diego Garcia. The base had weathered a far less intense attack than, say, Guam, which had been hammered with dozens of missile strikes. Its Patriot batteries had done a fair bit of work in conjunction with U.S. ships and knocked half of the incoming missiles out, but the rest had wrecked the runways, fuel storage, and hangars housing aircraft. The damage was immense and it would take months to bring Guam back online. Diego Garcia would be fully operational in a fraction of the time, but for now, the runway used by Allied long-range strike and recon aircraft was not operational and aircraft carriers were at a premium, badly needed closer to China's own shores. The attack had been part of an effort to disrupt U.S. and British operations in the Arabian Sea, and an attempt to dislodge the blockading force already on its way there. With their ships positioned at the mouth of the Gulf of Oman, China's badly needed oil supplies could be squeezed off, 
as the nation imported the majority of its oil via the sea, has put it in a seriously compromised situation. With current reserves as well as oil being delivered from Russia, China could ration supplies of oil to its civilians, diverting most of it for combat operations. However, this would strangle the Chinese economy, while in return, China could do nothing to threaten US and allied trade. It was clear how the war would end then. In retaliation, American special forces, including a company of rangers, had launched a raid on the Chinese base in Djibouti against the local government's wishes. Japanese self-defense air force craft flying from their own air base in the country provided close air support in the brief but intense fighting. The base was now neutralized and it was time to do the same with the People's Liberation Army Navy ships it was supporting. Originally, the Chinese plan to dislodge the American boot on their throat had been to launch a disruptive attack on Diego Garcia, followed by an attack on U.S. naval forces by both surface and undersea platforms. But of the half-dozen Chinese attack submarines secretly sent to make a transit to the area to join in on the attack, only one had made it through Allied lines. It had been a gamble, but Chinese subs were much noisier than American or European ones. To make matters worse for the Chinese, Britain wasn't the only European power throwing its weight behind the U.S. France, Germany, and Spain had all sent ships to the region over the summer and now joined the fight directly. Russia's attack on Ukraine had solidified the NATO alliance and filled it with terrible resolve. The NATO fleet steamed west toward the smaller Chinese fleet formerly based around Djibouti. The gamble had failed. Without attack submarines for support, there was little hope of Chinese victory here. AWACS aircraft spotted the enemy fleet hundreds of kilometers away, feeding targeting data to friendly forces. At a range of 300 nautical miles, the American ships fired first loosing a volley of AGM-158C LRASM. These long-range anti-ship missiles had recently been upgraded with the ability to be launched from U.S. Navy vertical launch cell systems on the decks of its warships, where before they could only be carried by combat aircraft. Fired in volleys, each missile carries a 1,000-pound warhead and flies to 25,000 feet. Their sophisticated sensor suite allows each missile to sniff out the electromagnetic and thermal signature of enemy ships and verify what the missile sees with an onboard library of known enemy vessels. Thus, the smart missiles avoid hitting friendly or neutral targets. Networked together, they can even designate targets in flight, so missiles don't double up or triple up on a single target unless necessary. All these capabilities, however, are a backup to its onboard data link, so if severed, the missile can still track ID and prosecute the target. Once within 100 miles of their target, the volley of LRASMs plunge toward the ocean, skimming over the top of the waves. This allows them to slip under the defensive radars until they get to within a few dozen miles of their target. The harpoons used by the rest of the U.S. ships and their allies would have been spotted on Chinese radar long ago, but the LRASM's stealth quality allowed it to get within two dozen miles before air defense radar sniffed them out. Immediately, the Chinese vessels fire off waves of interceptors, but fire control radars have difficulty locking on to the jet black American missiles. The first wave of interceptors miss their target and auto-detonate harmlessly over the ocean. The second volley of interceptors manage to destroy a few of the incoming missiles. There isn't time for a third volley. Perhaps if the Chinese enjoyed the support of an AWACS platform, they could have detected the American missiles earlier and had more engagement time with more accurate tracking. But without it, the ships are forced to rely on their own systems, limited by radar horizons and minimum tracking altitudes. Chinese Sea Whiz cannons roar to life as the air fills with thousands of supersonic tungsten rounds. The tracers make each stream of Sea Whiz fire look like an arcing laser that sweeps across the sky. More LRASMs are shredded by cannon fire, but now, under two miles of their targets, the black missiles suddenly pop up to gain altitude for a top attack profile that'll see them smashing into the enemy ships from above. The fleet's entire Sea Whiz systems are filling the sky with fire, knocking more missiles out of the air. But it's not enough. With thunderous roars, the thousand-pound warheads smash into Chinese ships, punching through the top of each ship and detonating inside of them for maximum damage. Only half of the LRASM volley made it through the gamut of air defense, but the thousand-pound warheads are devastating. To make matters worse, within half an hour, the Allied fleet will be in range of traditional harpoon missiles, which they carry in the dozens. With a significant amount of their missile defense interceptors and Sea Whiz ammunition depleted already, there's little hope for the small Chinese fleet to hold off the onslaught to come. And even less hope that China can maintain its vital trade artery to the Middle Eastern oil. In the end, it'll matter little if Chinese forces manage to successfully land on Taiwan, an ongoing campaign that has already seen Chinese casualties in the thousands. The island has been turned into a veritable fortress with one goal in mind. Hang on long enough for the Allied fleets to starve China into submission. With the Gulf of Oman plugged, Allied air power will now work to destroy the People's Liberation Army Air Force and sweep it from the skies of Taiwan, while submarines whittle away the planned ships. 
Taiwan will bear a heavy cost, but in the end, strangled off from its badly needed oil imports, World War III only ends one way. This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream. Use our link in the description below for a 30-day trial giving you unlimited access to thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers when you use the code infographics. Perhaps we're rather pessimistic, but we're inclined to believe that sooner or later there will be a World War III or some other apocalyptic event. We're not going to delve into which country will cause what. It could be the assassination of a world leader that triggers a war, or perhaps a plague that causes zombies. But ultimately, there's going to be a devastating series of events that will cause mass destruction, misery, and death on a large scale. So if you're used to your butler bringing your lobster and champagne when you ring a bell, how do you prepare for doomsday? Ok, maybe that was a silly stereotype. But the super wealthy have made plans far beyond the typical doomsday prepper to not only survive in comfort and preserve their fortunes, but also to thrive and possibly even make money off the destruction or reconstruction. For the purpose of this video, we're defining super rich as people who have over 30 million dollars. This is about 0.003% of the world's population, and in 2018 this was 265,490 individuals. Collectively, their combined total wealth was estimated to be $32.3 trillion, or about 13% of the world's total wealth. Obviously, you'd want to make sure your financial assets are in the best position possible to not only ride out the war, but if and when the world begins to rebuild, you can thrive. A common side effect of war is to prepare for hyperinflation. During World War II, Hungary was economically devastated. As a war zone, the country's infrastructure was destroyed, buildings were left in ruins, and personal wealth was looted. Also, Hungary was heavily in debt for extending credit to and producing goods for Germany, which never paid it back. After the war ended, Hungary was forced to pay reparations to the Soviets. All this led to the Hungarian government printing more money, which caused a really bad case of hyperinflation. In August 1945, one kilogram of bread cost six Hungarian pengos. Less than a year later, in May 1946, the same amount of bread cost eight million pengos. It doesn't even take war to cause hyperinflation. More recently, countries have experienced hyperinflation due to land expropriation and printing extra money while the country is running a deficit, etc. The super rich are already adept at protecting their wealth, such as hiding assets behind shell companies or moving money to unaccountable and largely untaxed offshore accounts and corporations. However, in recent years, they've intensified the diversity of their investments, often buying sovereign bonds for countries they think could be on the winning side of a major war and investing in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Also, they've put significant amount of money into a variety of tangible assets such as gold, silver, copper, steel, and oil, which could be used to rebuild society after a cataclysmic event. Of course, you need places to store such items. What could be better than storage at a luxurious doomsday bunker? Over the past 20 years, there's been a surge in people building doomsday bunkers, especially the rich. In fact, a number of companies have sprung up catering to building doomsday domiciles for the well healed. The Survival Condo Project is one such corporation. They've repurposed a silo at the former Atlas F missile launch site in Kansas into an underground oasis that can sustain 75 people for over five years. The facility features condos with lavish furnishings, and among the many shared amenities are an indoor pool, a library, dog park, movie theater, and medical first aid center. Of course, the whole community is protected with cutting-edge technology. The price ranges from $1.5 million plus for a 900-square-foot condo with one or two bedrooms to $4.5 million for a penthouse suite. Thinking of taking out a loan for purchasing such a fancy hidey hole? Not so fast. Many banks won't loan money to purchase secondary luxury shelters. The community only considers buyers who have the funds for purchase in liquid capital. The Survival Condo Project has completely sold out its first silo and is now building out a second silo which is also in Kansas. There are actually a number of expensive shelter communities around the world. In a quiet valley of the Czech Republic is the Opidum. At 323,000 square feet above and below ground, it's the world's largest exclusive luxury bunker. You can't even view the Opidum's website without a secret invitation code. Other corporations such as the Rising S Company sells customizable bunkers which they'll build anywhere in the world for clients. Their top-of-the-line luxury underground bunker is called the Aristocrat, and it starts at $8.5 million plus installation costs. Among the many features it comes with are a sauna, a gym, a media room, bowling alley, multi-vehicle garage with motor cave, and a greenhouse for sustainable food growing. While the company has not publicly disclosed how many aristocrats they've sold, in the last few years business has boomed for them. 
Yet other companies specialize in outfitting existing property to be survival ready. Depending on the property, that may mean adding such features such as an underground shelter, solar panels, a water reserve tank, etc. Central to having a fancy yet functional abode for when the world is burning is where the property is located. In recent years, many of the wealthiest Americans have purchased millions of acres of America's heartland and the Pacific Northwest where farming and living off the land is sustainable. Others have sought dual citizenship in countries that they think will be the safest for riding out apocalyptic events, such as Canada or Argentina. New Zealand's mainly rural landscape and the low human population is especially popular with tech billionaires building survival real estate. The fact that New Zealand is commonly not considered a nuclear target is probably part of the appeal too. In recent years, several wealthy American citizens have sought citizenship through the New Zealand Investor Plus Visa, which allows them to bypass the normal immigrant process, but requires them to invest upwards of 10 million New Zealand dollars in the country over three years. Others have focused on amassing citizenship in multiple countries and EU passports, sometimes with lovely private properties in each country, so if times get tough, they have a choice of multiple destinations to flee to. Great, you have a fancy protected mansion to survive the apocalypse in style, and thankfully you have loyal employees who in return for a safe place to ride out the apocalypse will protect and maintain your property. But there's one huge problem, travel. Once the zombies begin to rise or war starts, how do you get to your fancy digs so you can hunker down? Well, if you purchased a condo in the survival condo community, they offer three different contingency plans for getting to the facility. These plans are only fully disclosed to purchasers. However, publicly the company has mentioned that if a condo owner can get within 400 miles of the community, SWAT team style trucks will be sent to pick them up. Other one percenters have arranged to keep helicopters, small planes or jets on standby near their primary locations in case you know what begins hitting the fan. Some people have even opted to take flying lessons so they can fly even if a pilot isn't available. To get to the airport, many wealthy preppers keep SWAT-style SUVs or motorcycles. Of course, the vehicles are well maintained and the gas tanks are filled. Basically, at a moment's notice, they can leave and outrun, run down or slip through the great unwashed citizenry to make it to the airport to catch their ride to a fancy secure dig. Many of us have a go or emergency bag filled with a change of clothing, basic medical supplies, some snacks, a little cash, and maybe some important documents and beloved pictures on a storage drive. What do wealth preppers keep in their go bags? Beyond the usual, they keep stacks of cash, flashbangs, guns, knives, and bars of gold. The thought being that they'll be able to fight or bribe their way out of any situation and maybe even convince people to help them get to their regional travel point. So if the world undergoes a cataclysmic event, you can expect the very wealthy to survive. <laughs> but you probably can't count on them to pitch in and lend a helping hand in fighting off the zombie horde. Maybe more likely they're chilling in a luxury bunker somewhere, maybe with a supply of antibiotics and other goods that they can barter or sell at exorbitant prices once the initial event has died down and people decide to venture outside. There are even a few billionaires who are pursuing space technology with an eye toward building communities on Mars for when Earth becomes unsustainable for humanity. Though some claim they have altruistic motives, it remains to be seen if our ventures to another planet will end up being an escapist destination for the rich who can afford it, or a mass migration opportunity to sustain humans from all walks of life. Japan finds itself at a crossroads. After decades of post-World War II reforms and peace in the Pacific, the former military empire, now turned pacifist, is staring once more down the barrel of a gun. In a move that's angered many of Japan's neo-pacifists, its military is rearming and its constitution is being reinterpreted as it eyes ever more potent offensive weapons. Because Japan is preparing for World War III to break out in its backyard. In previous videos, we've pointed out how the US is one of the most privileged nations on Earth, with two massive oceans on either side and no major power anywhere in its entire global hemisphere, mostly because the US threatened to fight with any European power expanding there in the late 19th and early 20th century. This has made the US just about untouchable as any enemy, as well as incredibly resilient during times of war thanks to its abundant natural resources and ability to shift to shipping from either coast. But if the US got the best spawn in the world, Japan got the absolute worst. The nation is resource poor and doesn't even grow enough food to feed its own population. These fundamental weaknesses are what prompted Japan's ill-fated attempt to oust the US from the Pacific during the Second World War, and what put it on a collision course with the Russian Empire just prior to the Russo-Japanese War. If Japan was going to be a great nation, it needed to expand past its borders to the mainland and turn Korea and China into colonies that would feed the island nation's ambitions. Trade is the name of the game for Japan, 
And while pretty much every nation's economy relies on international trade, Japan's is critically dependent on it. Without the ability to ship goods in and out of the country, Japan would collapse financially and its people would starve, with only enough food growing capacity to feed a fraction of its current population. In 2020, Japan had a self-sufficiency rate of only 37% based on an average 2,000 calorie diet. This means that if all trade ended immediately, Japan could only feed 37% of its population, or about 46.5 million of its 125.7 million population. That's a steep drop-off from 1960, when Japan could cover all of its own food needs with a population of 94 million. The threat of being cut off from food imports is so dire for Japan that it's prompting a re-evaluation of its national self-defense policy, and the nation is looking at ways to combat ever-expanding urbanism while also expanding available farmland. And it's not just food, it's pretty much everything necessary for a modern society to function. Japan's top five imports are petroleum products, natural gas, electronic components for telecommunications, semiconductors, and coal. At the same time, Japan's top exports include cars, microchips, and motor vehicle transmissions. China and the US are Japan's biggest trade partners respectively, but with about $700 billion in imports and exports, both Japan trades globally. And in what appears to be a repeat of the nation's pre-World War II history, Japan is once more building up its military to secure its trade interests, but this time it's not quite the same. Once upon a time, Japan dreamed of an empire, but today's Japan is just looking to ensure its own independence and national survival. The nation is perfectly happy to cooperate globally along established norms, but its over-dependence on foreign trade is a glaring Achilles heel that an increasingly aggressive China could potentially exploit, with disastrous consequences. Japan's major trade routes run across the Indian Ocean, through the Straits of Malacca and past Taiwan to the home islands. Further, Japan sits exactly north of the Asia-North American trade route, through which more goods are transported than any other trade route in the world. With its most important trade routes running parallel to the Chinese coast and past Taiwan, China has a foot on Japan's trade jugular, and in case of a war, would not be afraid to apply pressure. Japan supports Taiwanese independence for many reasons, but it's this reason that ranks amongst the highest. A Chinese occupation of Taiwan would allow it to break the first island chain containment and send its warships freely out to sea. The first island chain consists of a chain of US-aligned nations that runs from Japan in the north to Taiwan in the center and the Philippines in the south. During the entirety of the Cold War, it was this island chain that hemmed in any communist navy activity to enter the Pacific. Today it serves pretty much the same purpose, and the US and its allies can prevent any Chinese vessel from sailing into the Pacific in case of a war. With China building up multiple new carriers and assembling them into battle groups, breaking containment would allow China to dictate trade in the whole of the Western Pacific and leave Japan at its mercy. However, it's not just trade that matters to Japan, it's keeping China from seizing a global monopoly on the thing that every modern economy today needs just as bad as it needs oil – microchips. Taiwan produces the majority of the world's microchips, and its specialized factories can build nearly the entire global supply of the most advanced 3mm kind that you can find in most sophisticated electronics and advanced military weapons. Decades ago, the US got out of the microchip game as they could be more cheaply produced overseas. Taiwan saw an opportunity and leapt at it, and today its microchip monopoly works as an insurance policy. No nation that values its own sovereignty has any interest in allowing China to seize Taiwan and thus impose its will upon them by threatening chip embargoes. Francis Macron may talk a big game about Europe seeking a third path with China that doesn't align with the US's opposition to a Chinese invasion, but until Macron figures out how to replace microchips with croissants in sensitive electronics, literally the entire French economy still needs free access to Taiwan's microchips. And in Macron's world, China will give you that access as long as the entire EU does exactly what the Chinese Communist Party wants them to do. Because the moment that that guy who banned Winnie the Pooh from all of China doesn't like what you're saying in your free press, no more microchips for you, and then no more economy. Japan just doesn't want to live in that world, which is why it's greatly increased its interoperability with the US military in one key way – expeditionary forces. Pacifism is enshrined in the Japanese constitution, put there on purpose by the United States after World War II. And one would find it hard to blame them when Japan had just set fire to literally the entire Pacific. The world could do with a whole lot less bonsai charges to the death and a whole lot more Pokemon. 
so Japan beat its swords into pens and began to create anime instead. The Japanese self-defense force was limited to pure self-defense missions only, with equipment appropriate only for the immediate defense of the Japanese islands and the waters surrounding them. Pacifism made its way all the way down to the specific weapons that Japan armed itself with, meaning they have no long-range attack cruise missiles or bombers, for instance. This worked out pretty great for a few decades. But then, all of a sudden, the US simply couldn't sail carrier strike groups through the Taiwan Strait every time China threw a temper tantrum, and Japan woke up to the horrible realization that the very lifeblood of its economy sailed right past a very belligerent Chinese coast. As a matter of national sovereignty and possibly even survival, Japan needed to change drastically and face a new reality, one where the US was no longer the undisputed master of the Pacific. The Chinese military buildup mirrored its domestic economic explosion that rocked the world starting in the late 1990s. One year, China was a large but disorganized and poorly equipped nation that couldn't even challenge a single American carrier strike group a few dozen miles off its own coast. The next year, China was pumping out aircraft, missiles, and ships at a truly frightening rate. Today, the Chinese People's Liberation Army Navy is the largest navy in the world, even if by tonnage and battle force missile count the US is still superior. But a very carefully crafted strategy of area denial anti-access has ensured that in case of war, the US will take a long time to contain the Chinese Navy, and at a very high cost to itself. China's plan to become the next global superpower and dethrone the US is a direct threat to Japan, and to isolate Japan from its American ally, China has invested heavily into technologies to keep US ships and aircraft at arm's length. The cornerstone of anti-access area denial, or A2D2, as the cool kids know it by, is the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force. The PLARF is an entire military service dedicated to long-range precision attack utilizing crews and ballistic missiles, and its inventory is huge, with an estimated 1,800 missiles of varying ranges, with most of them able to strike into the waters around Japan and even the home islands themselves. Its massive stockpile is spread out across mobile launchers and six missile bases in the Chinese mainland, where they're all well protected from attack. Its Air Force, meanwhile, is equipped with over 231 H-6 strategic bombers, which have an intercontinental range and can deliver devastating bombardments via air-launched cruise missiles. Its ever-growing fleet also has the ability to lob hundreds of surface attack cruise missiles against inland targets. And its growing carrier capability means that soon, China will be able to project power far from its own shores, something it has historically been unable to do. All this puts the US Navy on the defensive in the Pacific and leaves Japan very vulnerable in case of war, which is why Japan is preemptively fighting back by redefining its own pacifist constitution. Japan has played fast and loose with its definition of pacifism for a few years now. The nation has 22 attack submarines in service, and they're all pretty darn good boats. Its oldest class, the Oyashio class, was laid down in the late 1990s, and Japan has not stopped innovating since then. Its new Taiye class of boats are powered by huge banks of lithium-ion batteries, allowing for greater endurance and higher speeds than other diesel-electric submarines. The added range is of growing concern for a Japan that faces the prospect of having to face off against planned ships far from its own shores. Many have argued that Japan would be better served with nuclear submarines, allowing the nation to launch patrols across the entire Pacific if it wished. In 2022, opposition parties in Japan's upper house floated the idea of Japan acquiring nuclear boats, likely with the assistance of the US. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, however, was very apprehensive about that idea, given Japan's feelings on the use of atomic energy within their military, as well as the high operational cost of a nuclear submarine fleet. The debate over nuclear submarines rages to this day. On one hand, Japan's current fleet is more than adequate for self-defense of its own coastal waters. Even with advanced batteries and air-independent diesel propulsion, conventional subs simply don't have the range to operate far from home. That's why the United States has never seriously considered adding them to its arsenal. But on the other hand, the lack of a long-range patrol capability means that Japan remains completely dependent on the US to secure its own trade routes through increasingly hostile waterways. Japan thus risks not only its economic future, but its future as an independent nation by aligning with the US. Luckily for Japan, the US is committed to the decades-old alliance between the two powers, and even with highly divisive domestic policies, is incredibly unlikely to end this cooperation. However, China's rise may do what American politics can't, and if the US can't operate safely in the Pacific, Japan's inability to strike far out at sea will force it to become a Chinese vassal.
Further bending the interpretation of its pacifist constitution, Japan has for years played coy with its own definition of the commonly accepted destroyer class of ship. In pretty much every other global navy, a destroyer is a large surface vessel designed for long-range missile warfare and air defense, as well as anti-submarine warfare. Japan agrees with this definition, but its destroyers also feature a huge flight deck and an entire complement of advanced naval fighters. This nation operates four um, helicopter destroyers, two of the Izumo class and two of the Hayuka class. Like a good destroyer, the Hayuka class carries vertical cells for air defense missiles and anti-submarine rockets, as well as torpedo tubes. It also happens to be equipped with 18 attack utility and anti-submarine helicopters and is undergoing modifications to be able to host F-35s. The Izumo class pretty much does away with all pretenses and features no vertical launch cells for missiles, and instead can hold up to 28 VSTOL aircraft such as the F-35. Yet Japan insists that this is still a destroyer that happens to have no missiles that aren't fired by aircraft launched and recovered from its deck, because aircraft carriers are offensive weapons of war, and that would violate Japan's pacifist constitution. Naval aircraft holding and recovering vessels, however, are definitely not aircraft carriers in any sense, and thus, still defensive weapons. So Japan's aircraft carrier, I mean helicopter destroyers, are fully capable of expeditionary operations. But without submarines that can keep up, Japan is once more reliant on partner nations to fill in the capability gaps. The nation also operates 12 landing ships meant to move troops and armor to shore, including the Osumi class, which can launch and recover Ospreys full of marines. Normally, an obviously offensive weapon, this class of ship actually makes sense for Japan to have given the numerous islands the nation must defend. Japan also fields 36 conventional destroyers, with the more modern ships being equipped with the American Aegis combat system, which will be a key feature of all future destroyers. While about half of its destroyer fleet is woefully underarmed for a conflict with China, its new generation of destroyers come with 96 vertical launch cells, rivaling US and Chinese equivalents. However, Japan has some serious modernization to do to bring its destroyer fleet up to par, given the very limited capabilities of ships from its older classes, such as the Murasami and the Asagiri class, which don't have the missile capability to face up to modern threats. All in all, Japan's navy is small and capable, but in serious need of firepower upgrades if it's to face a conflict in the Pacific without direct US support. As China's own capabilities grow, though, the US will need greater and greater support from its partners in the region. Japan's Air Force would be called upon in a time of war to directly support US efforts over and around Taiwan, and it is well suited for the task. The primary air superiority fighter of the Japanese Air Self-Defense Force is the F-15J, a variant of the American F-15 Eagle built under license in Japan. This is an incredibly capable fighter with a range of about 3,000 nautical miles and a combat range of just under half that. This puts Taiwan and mainland China well within range of Japanese F-15s, and being an American aircraft built under license, it is perfectly compatible with the whole slew of new air-to-air -air missiles in development by the US. This is of serious concern to both Japan and the US, as the China's PL-15 air-to-air missile is simply put better than America's AIM-120. The PL-15 has a longer range, estimated at just over a dozen miles, than the AIM-120. Given Chinese fighters' first shoot capability against US and Japanese aircraft, this may not necessarily mean a kill, but it would force friendly fighters into a defensive posture, limiting their ability to engage Chinese aircraft and leaving themselves more vulnerable to follow-on shots. In response, the US is currently fast-tracking half a dozen new air superiority missiles, with the one slated to hit the shelf soon being the AIM-260. A two-stage missile, the AIM-260's range is classified but estimated to be around 30 miles greater than the PL-15. However, the missile has yet to enter full-scale production and may be only available in small numbers should hostilities break out in the next few years. This is why it's a good thing Japan has acquired the F-35 from the US and is looking to fully replace its F-15 fleet with the 5th Gen Stealth Fighter. Currently, it operates 34 F-35s of both the conventional and naval variant, a far more capable fighter than China's 4.5 Gen J-20. The F-35 Stealth would allow it to close the missile gap between itself and Chinese missiles, and still remain out of firing solution range as it opens fire first. The effect of the F-35 cannot be understated. With simulations of battles between 5th generation and 4th generation aircraft being overwhelmingly one-sided, the nation also has a large number of airborne early warning and air control aircraft, 
It operates four Boeing E-767s with 17 smaller E-2 Hawkeyes and nine more on order. Given the vast distances between Japan's islands, the capability to maintain surveillance over large swaths of ocean and airspace has always been critical for the modern Japanese military. However, China's growing stealth fleet is a direct threat to these very vulnerable aircraft, which is why it's imperative Japan acquires the F-35 along with new generations of American air-to-air -air missiles with longer ranges. The Japanese Ground Self-Defense Force features a large array of very mobile or manned portable air defense weapons. For a nation which faces the prospect of having to quickly move assets around a large island chain, mobility is key, which is why it fields many short-range mobile air defenses on wheeled chassis. Increasingly, though, Japan has been growing its arsenal of anti-ship missile batteries, with the Type 88 surface-to-ship missile fielded in the 1980s and the newer Type 12. However, both missiles have very limited range, making them suitable only for the immediate defense of Japanese territory. This deficiency has prompted Japan to make one of the most controversial military purchases in its history. In 2023, Japan signed a deal to buy $2 billion worth of Tomahawk cruise missiles. Even more controversially, these missiles will mostly be equipped on its destroyers. With a range of 1,000 miles or 1,600 kilometers, Japan will be able to bring hundreds of precision missiles to bear deep into Chinese territory, striking not just at planned ships out at sea, but at Chinese air and naval facilities deep inland. The purchase has angered not just the Chinese, but parts of the Japanese public, as the new missiles outrange the old Type 12 missiles by 800 miles, making it clear that they are offensive and not defensive weapons. Yet, offense is necessary for defense, as without the ability to strike at Chinese bases, Japan would be perpetually vulnerable to Chinese attack and unable to disrupt offensive operations. This is much the same controversy that surrounds current U.S. military planning as it considers a response to a war with China, with some in the U.S. government and military arguing against strikes on Chinese mainland bases and facilities, and others pointing out that to not strike at these mainland targets could result in an overall Chinese victory. Japan's armored forces face a bit of a modernity problem, with a significant number of Cold War tanks still in its inventory. Historically, the ground forces would only be utilized to retake an island lost by the Navy and Air Force, or at least this was the thinking until only recently, when the Japanese constitution was reinterpreted yet again to allow for Japan to field expeditionary forces in the interest of preemptive self-defense, or to respond to requests for aid by allies. This means that for the first time since the Korean War, Japan's army could be called upon to fight far from its home. And this is a bit of a problem given its relative lack of infantry fighting vehicles and over-reliance on armored transports, vehicles which, as Ukraine has shown, cannot do the job of dedicated IFVs and are very vulnerable on a modern battlefield. Yet the Japanese army makes up the lion's share of its military, and Japan has historically put an emphasis on its army over its naval and air forces. Given that Japan's primary threats are from the air and the sea, this mismatch needs correcting in the near future or Japan risks being unprepared for a major conflict in the Pacific. Another major problem for all branches of the Japanese military is its inability to find new recruits. In 2023, the SDF missed its recruiting benchmark by about 50%, and its turnover rate is extremely high, with 80% of enlistees in previous years only serving one or two two- to three-year terms. This is a significant problem for Japan, as it greatly reduces its available pool of experienced officers in both the commissioned and non-commissioned ranks. And all one has to do is look at Russia's performance in Ukraine to see the problems that not having enough professional soldiers and officers can cause. The main problem for Japan is its youth are opting for far more competitive salaries in the civilian market, a problem shared by pretty much every modern nation including the US, who's missed its own recruiting quotas significantly for years. However, Japan faces a unique problem going forward, a population time bomb. Due to low birth rates, the number of retirees is growing exponentially versus the number of active workers in the labor pool, putting massive strain on the Japanese economy and budget both. This is why Japan has put a focus on investing in automation, and while nations like the US look at military robots as tools to enhance the survivability and lethality of human soldiers, Japan may be the first nation to field combat robots in very large numbers out of sheer necessity. To counter the rising Chinese threat, Japan has announced a historical increase in its defense budget. Bucking the historical limit of 1% of GDP, with the goal of reaching NATO standard 2% of GDP by 2027, doubling their 2020 military budget, the move has prompted protests from segments of the Japanese population who fear that Japan is quickly leaving its pacifist roots behind. 
Japan and the US also announced a significant plan to boost their joint interoperability. Both nations have pledged to cooperate in the realms of cybersecurity and in the space domain, and are exploring ways of further integrating their militaries in case of war. NATO currently enjoys a unified command structure that alliance members fall into in case of war, and the US and Japan might be looking at a way to create similar capabilities in the Pacific to more easily and effectively operate together in a time of war. The first steps is the creation of a permanent joint headquarters to be built in Japan. The two nations have also increased their coordination in ISR, or Intelligence, Surveillance and Reconnaissance. Japan has welcomed the deployment of American MQ-9 drones to Kanoya Air Base, and the two nations are making efforts to increase the ability to jointly share and analyze intelligence. The two powers also expanded the joint use of facilities on Japanese bases and established joint training areas on Japan's southwest islands. Closer Japanese and U.S. cooperation, including the shared use of Japanese bases, strengthens Japanese security, but also puts it at risk of attack in case of a U.S. war with China over Taiwan. While it's incredibly unlikely that Japan wouldn't back a U.S. war over Taiwan, the choice is all but gone now that U.S. forces will have ever more access to Japanese bases. This puts Japanese bases squarely in the crosshairs of Chinese counter-force assets, as China cannot allow the U.S. to have any toehold in the Pacific if it's to win a battle for Taiwan. In many ways, while Japan's security is bolstered by closer military ties with the U.S., it also means that Japan's die is cast in a future Sino-American conflict. And this is deeply troubling for many Japanese people who fear that their nation's days as a pacifistic power are at an end. Germany is one of the guarantors of European security, and yet the entire world questions if Germany's military is up to the task. Is Germany ready to fight a major conflict in Europe, and how would it perform? Russia's invasion of Ukraine was a wake-up call for a complacent, pacifist Europe. After the end of the Cold War, Europe had a reason to relax. But while everyone was taking siestas and sipping espressos at their favorite bistro, Russia was plotting. When Russia first invaded Ukraine in 2014, Europe hardly blinked because not only had it become complacent, but it had become extremely dependent on the energy supplied by the only challenge to their own national security. Nobody was more guilty of this than Germany, who foolishly believed it could sway Moscow via trade dependence. Instead, Germany handed Putin the very reins of its economy. The second invasion of Ukraine at last woke Europe up to the fact that it still had a belligerent, much bigger neighbor on its border. By then, though, the state of many European militaries was utterly abysmal, and few major European powers were in worse shape than Germany. During the Cold War, the readiness rate of the West German military hovered around 90%. Today, that figure is anywhere between 20 to 40%, meaning that only 20 to 40% of its personnel and equipment is ready for immediate action. For years, Germany couldn't even meet its NATO commitments to the Rapid Response Force established during the Obama presidency to counter sudden Russian aggression unless it first cannibalized other units for supplies and gear. In 2018, Jorge Benitez of the Atlantic Council think tank stated, The readiness of the German military is abysmal. For years, German leaders have known that major elements of their armed forces such as tanks, submarines and fighter jets are not fully operational and can't be used for actual military missions. Despite Germany's strong economy, its military was found to be one of the weakest on the continent. Famously, President Donald Trump considered Germany a freeloader, coasting on the might of the US and the rest of NATO as guarantors of its own security. At the same time, not a single one of Germany's submarines could take to sea. Only four of its 128 Eurofighter were prepared for combat and the Army's vehicles were unprepared to meet NATO combat requirements. Its troops had no body armor, no night vision equipment, and even lacked cold weather clothing. How in the world could one of Europe's economic powerhouses have a military incapable of defending even its own borders? The answer is a strong pacifist streak amongst German policymakers, but also a willingness to sacrifice on security in order to stimulate its national economy. And when you've got one of the largest concentrations of American troops outside of the U.S. borders in your territory, you probably feel pretty secure. Hiding under America's skirts, Germany instead preferred to spend its money on everything but defense, crippling its ability to fight even a light-intensity conflict. But German society is also deeply uncomfortable with military spending, and given its history in the first half of the 20th century, it is easy to see why. In a 2018 poll, 51% of those surveyed stated that they did not want their military budget to increase, despite a pledge to NATO in 2014 to finally hit 2% of GDP spending on its own defense. 
13% wanted even further cuts. Time and again, Germany tried to push through some legislature to increase military spending, but inevitably it was either slashed or failed to pass into law with the funds instead being diverted to social welfare programs. Despite this, in 2019, Germany led NATO's Very High Readiness Joint Task Force, designed to quickly deploy to hotspots in Eastern Europe. German defense documents leaked to the public by the Die Welt newspaper showed that the German contingent of this task force only had nine of the 44 Leopard 2 tanks it needed operational, and only three of the 14 Martyr armored personnel carriers. The German Air Force's readiness was even worse, needing partner support to even get a fraction of its air power to the skies. The security situation is critical thanks to a resurgent Russia, and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz declared an end to the decline of the German military by pledging a $104 billion increase in defense spending and to meet NATO's requirement of 2% of GDP. Yet already there are doubts that more than half of this money will actually end up being procured and spent on the military and Germany's bold rearmament plans might be nothing but hot air. Europe's largest economy could once more end up coasting on the strength of its NATO partners, outsourcing its own defense while spending money elsewhere. For a long time, Germany's European partners were deeply uncomfortable with a military resurgence for Germany, for very obvious reasons. However, in recent years, opinion polls show that the rest of Europe is a lot more comfortable with the idea of a strong German military than in previous decades. In fact, much of the world sees it as a necessity for the stability of Western democracies, especially as Russia and China rise to challenge the world order with their own authoritarian models. Fears that NATO might fall apart, spurred on largely by the Donald Trump presidency, has even led people like Francis Emmanuel Macron to push for Europe to guarantee its own security with a powerful EU military. Germany would necessarily be the centerpiece of such a military if it got its act together. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has successfully swayed the German public opinion though, with now 63% stating that they support the plan to spend $104 billion on the military in the coming years. But Chancellor Schultz hasn't done himself or Germany any favors. His longtime refusal and constant moving of the goalposts in regards to sending Leopard 2s to Ukraine has eroded Germany's credibility to the point that much of Europe is once more looking at the US for leadership in its own backyard. When it comes to military spending, Olaf is once more waffling, stating one day that he doesn't wish to repeat the mistakes of pre-World War I Germany in rearming itself, while the next day stating that a strong German military would encourage its NATO allies that the nation can be counted on. Schultz has done so much waffling since the invasion of Ukraine, the man practically runs his own Waffle House at this point, and it's hurting Germany's image abroad. The Polish people have developed a very low opinion of their neighbor, with Polish President Andrzej Duda stating, The mood here is very critical. Germany's just not a credible power because it has been moving so slowly. The focus in Poland is so much about what the US and Great Britain are doing. So, is Germany ready for a third global war? No, it isn't. Readiness rates have not improved much since 2018. Though we can expect to see this improve in the wake of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the German Air Force still struggles to put planes in the air or give its pilots enough flight hours to remain qualified on their combat jets. To be prepared for a major power conflict, Germany needs to reverse course on decisions made as far back as 2008. Back then, German defense thinking gravitated around the reduction of the German military to become a light expeditionary force. This suited the nation's current needs and greeds perfectly as it faced no credible threat at home, was so intertwined in trade with Russia that it believed Moscow wouldn't threaten their economic relationship, and at the time was only fighting low-intensity conflicts against insurgent or terror groups in the Middle East. Thus, German heavy fighting units began to be dramatically cut, with heavy combat vehicles being slashed first. Currently, Germany is unlikely to be able to field even a single heavy brigade, let alone keep it supplied during high-intensity combat ops. Currently, according to a German Ministry of Defense analysis, 71 of Germany's major combat systems have readiness rates of about 77%. This is a vast improvement, but many in NATO are casting a skeptical eye on the report, given the German military's previous problems with readiness. 11 systems had readiness ratings of under 50% though, with combat vehicles standing at 71%. Naval combat units stood at 72%, combat and transport aircraft were at 65%, support vehicles at 82% and helicopters at an abysmal 40%. The report also found that despite improved readiness rates, the German military was struggling with modernity issues. Many of its armored vehicles were either severely aged or obsolete. 
its CH-53 helicopters and P-3C patrol aircraft were in states of crisis and in dire need of replacement. Its attack helicopters were also in serious trouble and facing big modernity problems. At sea, the problem is even worse, with only 30% of the German Navy being fully operational. But the readiness figures have been cleverly manipulated, as these figures only account for equipment that the military actually has available and on hand. The numbers don't account for equipment that is either being repaired or upgraded by the manufacturer. Of 289 Leopard 2s, only 183 of them are actually available to the Army, or 63%. Germany then claims a readiness rate of 75%, which means only 137. Less than half of the entire fleet is actually ready for combat operations today. To turn things around, Germany needs to restructure its defense industry from the bottom up. Currently, German defense manufacturers work with a very small number of orders per year. Therefore, in order to avoid shutting a production line down and losing technical expertise, German arms manufacturers instead work very slowly, dragging the work on each vehicle sent for repair or upgrade out over months. Increased spending will necessarily mean more production, but even during protracted lulls, Germany needs to absorb the economic impact of keeping a set number of production and repair facilities fully staffed and prepared at all times, instead of shutting them down and consolidating to a smaller number of facilities. Changing German culture will also be necessary for Germany to repair its military. Currently, Germany is experiencing a surge in popular support for defense spending. But should the Ukrainian war end in the near future, it's unlikely the support will continue. When it comes to defense, modern Germans are notoriously short-sighted. For one, there's no strong cultural support for the military in Germany, and the military must compete with civilian employers to attract soldiers. Given that Germany only ended conscription in 2011 and is having great difficulty implementing an all-volunteer force, these do not look like problems that Germany is set to solve anytime soon. So how would Germany fight a major global conflict in its backyard? Simply put, not very well. One must not underestimate German industry and its historical power to pump out weapons at high intensity, but modern warfare moves incredibly quickly and consumes resources at a truly astonishing rate. Even the United States found itself seriously reconsidering the readiness of both its military and military-industrial capacity after the first few months of fighting in Ukraine. That's why it's important for Germany to build a strong military and military-industrial complex today. For now, the best that Germany could do is provide logistical support and perhaps, at best, a heavy combat brigade. Germany would rely on the US and the rest of NATO partners for all of the heavy lifting. Its naval forces with a readiness rate hovering around 30% would be essentially useless on their own, and instead what ships could actually sail would find themselves thrown into American or European formations under the command of foreign admirals. Likewise, its air force would be relegated to fulfilling niche obligations incapable of sustaining high-tempo combat ops on the front line. For the sake of European security and the credibility of Western democracies, Germany must reverse course now. The time of coasting on the defense capabilities of others is over. The peace dividend of the end of the Cold War is over, so said France's President Emmanuel Macron. As the world enters a new age and leaves behind the peaceful decades following the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Russian bear has once more awoken and brought with it the threat of full-scale war in Europe. In the last few months, we've been highly critical of European countries and the status of their militaries, and with good reason. What used to be some of the most powerful militaries on Earth have become atrophied husks of their former selves. In some way, this is to be expected, as pretty much every Western nation stood down from their Cold War high-readiness state. But in many ways, Europe has allowed its militaries to atrophy to the point it's become criminal and put an incredible burden on the United States to be the guarantor of European security. Many Americans, rightfully so, feel that Europe has been largely freeloading on the US's security guarantees. France, however, is not one of those nations. While its military is still not in great shape for a major conflict today, the Ukraine war has shown us that most nations' militaries aren't fully prepared for high-intensity combat either, including the US. Even so, the French military remains a competent and capable force on the continent. While once Britain's fleets and Germany's ground forces were to be feared, it's now France who's almost certainly the dominant European power in both areas. France and the UK both have around 200,000 active duty personnel, with nearly equal number of reservists, 35,000 versus UK's 37,000. The French defense budget is only $5 billion short of the UK's $50 billion budget, and yet France fields a significantly more capable military than the UK, 
It has just over 1,000 combat aircraft versus the UK 663, with 226 dedicated fighter aircraft versus 119. On the ground, France does come up five tanks short of the UK, with 222 versus the UK's 227, while the UK takes the edge slightly on armored vehicles and artillery. At sea, the UK operates two aircraft carriers versus France's lone Charles de Gaulle nuclear carrier, but France has three smaller assault carriers while the UK has none. France also operates four more destroyers than the UK, though one less sub. So what makes France probably Europe's best military at the moment? For once, it's proven its ability to fight largely independently of any other power. For over a decade, France has been involved in a fight against Islamic extremists across Africa, and while it's had the support of the US in various ways, France has been able to operate largely independently during this protracted campaign. The UK, meanwhile, is extremely dependent on the US for logistical support including physically moving its troops where they're needed. If a European battle royale were to break out right now, smart money's on France or Spain at the moment, not the typical military powerhouses of the UK and Germany. France was one of the first countries to wake up to the realization that the Cold War peace dividend was over and take action. President Macron has pledged over 500 billion in spending through 2030, meaning that by the end of the decade, the French military's budget would be doubled. This is especially good news for its nuclear arm, as France remains EU's sole nuclear power, but is in a bad need of upgrades and modernization. This is hardly news though, as every nuclear power is either in the middle of modernization or planning to start the process soon, having allowed nuclear systems to deteriorate since the end of the Cold War. But France was already modernizing even before the outbreak of the Ukraine war. Starting in 2020, the French military has been undergoing a 40-year modernization plan named Scorpion. France has taken a page out of the US military's playbook and is looking to adopt a similar network-centric style of warfare. In the US, this is known as Joint All-Domain Command and Control and consists of networking together various weapon platforms and soldiers. This allows the US assets to work closely together to the point of allowing one asset to spot a target and a completely different one to engage it. It's the key to the high mobility and high lethality of the US forces, and France has definitely taken notice. France calls it combined collaborative combat, and it's specifically looking into information technology upgrades for its armored forces. The military is looking to bring light and medium armor platforms into current military networks, much like its heavy tank fleet. This will be an immediate force multiplier for many platforms that normally are too lightly armored to operate in the thick of combat operations. By networking them together with more survivable platforms, they can quickly engage targets and then fall back out of danger. One of the biggest upgrades is the Jaguar Armed Recon and Combat Vehicle. This vehicle is meant to replace three different platforms, the AMX 10RC Tank Destroyer, the ERC-90 Sergei Armored Recon Vehicle, and the VAB Hot Mephisto Armored Personnel Carrier. Replacing three vehicles with one means incredibly more efficient logistics support, even if it's coming with some compromises. The Jaguar is not as survivable as its American Striker counterpart, for example, but it's better prepared for World War III for one key reason. Unlike the American Striker, the Jaguar makes use of a commercial truck chassis, meaning that it can be easily replaced during high attritional conflict. The Striker, meanwhile, has to be built from scratch by its manufacturer. This simple fact is even more important given that war games between US forces and a comparable near-peer force show that within six months of fighting, most of the US tank fleet would be destroyed or left inoperable. In that same time, the US would be lucky to replenish 20% of its losses, even with boosted production capacity. By the end of the first year of high-intensity combat, the most common vehicle used by the American forces would be a simple armored gun truck. In such a catastrophic high-intensity scenario against a near-peer, France would be far better prepared to replenish losses with a capable combat vehicle compared to America. France's Scorpion modernization plan will interface Titan in 2030. This will run through to 2045 and have two different focuses. The first will be on modernizing France's heavy tanks, artillery and combat helicopters, advances in anti-tank munitions such as new anti-tank guided missiles or Russia's new 900mm kinetic energy penetrator for its T-14 Armadas will mean that French tanks require upgrades to armor, mobility, sensors and their own firepower. While Russia won't be fielding the T-14 anytime soon, especially after sanctions, eventually it will, or a possible adversary will field a similar threat. France simply cannot afford to rest on its heels despite fielding the very capable Leclerc. 
Upgrades for combat helicopters will focus on increased endurance, speed, and sensors. The Ukrainian war has proven that combat helicopters are extremely vulnerable on the modern battlefield, and better interconnectivity will allow them to operate safely in a higher threat environment. Attack helicopters are only good on the front lines, but if it becomes too deadly for them to operate, then they need to be able to speak with other military assets who could provide targeting solutions for their weapons. As the manned portable air defense threat is likely going to increase in lethality, the ability to provide precision fire support from outside the threat range of enemy air defenses is increasingly more critical. Likewise, French artillery will focus on upgrading their mobility and ability to network with other systems. The Ukrainian army has proven the deadly effectiveness of precision artillery, such as the US's Excalibur round, which allows an artillery piece to have the precision of a guided rocket or missile. While modern air defenses can do a good job of protecting from rockets and missiles, if employed properly, artillery shells are incredibly difficult to intercept and a battery of artillery working together could easily defeat even the best defenses. But French forces have a critical weakness that needs shoring up if it's to fight a modern conventional war. The French military can pack a mighty punch, but a RAND Corporation study pointed out its biggest weakness. It has low readiness levels and lacks depth. The deployment of French soldiers to act in anti-terrorism roles inside of France, as well as ongoing operations in Africa, have put a tremendous stress on the French military. And like the US, ongoing counterterrorism operations have eroded its edge in fighting conventional power conflicts. Currently, the French military is better geared for fighting light mobile conflicts against extremists in Africa rather than a major industrialized conflict. To increase readiness, the French military needs to focus training on fighting near-peer foes and large unit tactics. Its military must also be geared to be effective in a highly contested environment by an opponent wielding a large amount of anti-access area denial assets. Currently, Western militaries have been spoiled by fighting in extremely permissible environments, such as Sub-Saharan Africa or in the Middle East. However, to fight World War III, France must relearn how to fight without all the advantages it has enjoyed for over two decades. For example, a study conducted on US troops found an over-reliance on fire support by infantry. In a near-peer conflict, such fire support may not be available, and American infantry needs to be prepared to make the hard charges that their forefathers did in World War II and learn to fight without support elements if need be. If war did break out, though, it would likely be against either China or Russia, and in either case, France would enjoy the vast support of the entirety of NATO. In a conflict against Russia, France would be responsible for providing ground forces to the eastern allies such as Poland, where it's certain that NATO's major ground campaign would begin. Its air force, one of the best on the continent, would fly alongside US forces stationed in Germany as the tip of the aerial spear in a fight for the skies over Eastern Europe, before transitioning to ground support roles after sweeping the skies clear of Russian MiGs. At sea, France's navy would be critical for either a Russian or Chinese conflict. In case of a war in Europe, French surface vessels could be used to plug the Greenland-Iceland-UK gap, and thus keep Russian attack subs from striking at US Atlantic convoys, ferrying troops and equipment to mainland Europe. However, France could also support the operation to block up the Baltic Sea, a task made much simpler by the possible ascension of Sweden and Finland to NATO. In a Pacific conflict, French submarines would be of critical assistance to US forces. France, like its US ally, operates a nuclear submarine force. This gives them the endurance needed to assist in conflicts on the other side of the world. Given that a war with China would be certain to break out over the invasion of Taiwan, France has strong reasons to see a Chinese invasion fail. A successful takeover of Taiwan by China would leave the Chinese Communist Party in control of most of the world's microchip supply, without which a modern economy cannot function. This would leave the CCP with irresistible leverage over France and the rest of the world. French nuclear weapons would hopefully never be used, but in case of a conflict, they act as the EU's only measure of independent nuclear deterrence. While Europe is covered by the US's nuclear umbrella, meaning that America has committed to responding with nukes against anyone nuking a European city, the four years of the Trump presidency put into doubt the security alliance of Europe and the US for the first time since World War II. Having an independent nuclear deterrent is of significant interest for the EU. No matter the conflict that they end up fighting, French forces have proven themselves to be competent and capable. Their only weakness is a lack of depth and a serious vulnerability to becoming combat ineffective due to high attrition. This is a weakness that every military has at the moment, given that no one, except perhaps North Korea, has given serious thought to the rate at which modern combat chews up equipment and ammunition. France has seen the threat, though, 
and is investing in not just its military but its defense industry too. But these investments have to compete with investments in education, healthcare, and other measures that have a direct and immediate impact on people's lives. Military investments are intangible for the average citizen, up until the moment they're not, because your nation's at war. Given how unlikely war is though, it remains to be seen just how committed the French people are to upgrading their military capabilities. The United Kingdom is no longer seen as a Tier 1 fighting force, so said a US senior general in a private conversation with British Defense Secretary Ben Wallace. Upon the news breaking, the British public was outraged at the US until defense analysts began to appear on talk shows to explain that the assessment was, in fact, correct. According to a British analyst, the UK military was unable to protect its home islands, let alone help defend its allies. How in the world did one of the world's most premier fighting forces get to a state where it couldn't even defend its own homeland? And what would the UK do in case of a third global war? While the UK military might be in a state of serious decline, the British government is at least much more forward-thinking than most of its European neighbors. Realizing that the war in Ukraine presented Europe with two choices, support Ukraine in fighting Russia in Ukraine today, or possibly fight Russia in Central Europe later, the UK opted for the former and opened up its armories to the Ukrainian military. Despite the military being in seriously short supply of air defense missiles and anti-tank weapons, the UK nonetheless started shipping them to Ukraine about as fast as it could load them onto the ships. Meanwhile, countries such as France, Germany, Spain, and Portugal have all been reluctant to provide large amounts of equipment of their own, stating that they need to be prepared to defend themselves in the future. And this begs the question of from what? With Russia struggling to hold on to East Ukraine, it's incredibly unlikely they'll be marching T-72s into Madrid anytime soon. But were the UK to find itself needing to fight Russia head-on, the end result is very much in question given the atrocious state of the modern British military. How did an elite fighting force, America's most capable Cold War partner, turn into what Allied soldiers in the Middle East would call the borrowers, for their propensity to never have all the kit they needed for a mission? Like most European powers, the UK fell prey to the Cold War peace dividend. With the fall of the Soviet Union, Europe assumed that the new Russia would renounce its historical ambitions for the empire, beat all their AK-47s into plowshares, and resolve all future conflicts with tactical hugs. Defense budgets dropped significantly, and research and development as well as procurement programs all but atrophied. Spending money on defense became a rude conversational topic and political suicide for any politician to even broach. War was best left to the Neanderthal Americans. Europe had established an impenetrable utopia defended almost entirely by good vibes that no weapon could pierce. On the one hand, it's hard to judge Europe for wanting to forget the absolute pants-browning terror of the Cold War taking place in their own backyards. Americans were always wary of World War III to the point of every other family building a fallout shelter, but Europeans had to worry about the horror of either nuclear or conventional war playing out in their very own living rooms. Europe was exhausted of war, hard to blame the continent for wanting to reinvest massive and arguably non-sustainable defense budgets on other things. But getting to a point where Britain's own politicians have said that the country only has enough ammunition for a few days of fighting is downright criminal. And this is only the tip of the iceberg, because also by their own admission, the UK would be wholly incapable of defending itself from the type of air attacks taking place in Ukraine. And if the nation wanted to field a single division of 30,000 troops, it would take between 5 to 10 years to equip them with sufficient tanks, helicopters, and artillery. Of the tanks and infantry fighting vehicles it does have, most are between 3 to 6 decades old and have no replacement in the pipeline. And if the UK was called upon to support its NATO partners, 30% of its high readiness forces are reservists, who can never make NATO timelines for deployment, undermining the entire alliance. The first signs of trouble came with the British commitment to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, which many blamed the US for dragging the UK into, but technically is just payback for previously dragging the US into scheming to protect British oil interests in Iran, and we all know how that's played out, so everyone's even Stevens as far as we're concerned. After the end of the Cold War, the British military began to ramp down and prepare for low-intensity operations. However, Iraq and Afghanistan proved to be higher-intensity conflicts than anticipated, and a military that had been put on course for a low-intensity fight was suddenly thrust into a conflict it wasn't fully prepared for. With operations in both countries, though, the UK quickly discovered it simply didn't have the resources to fight in two theaters simultaneously. By June 2010, the cost to the UK for both wars had risen to $31 billion, 
and this was in the wake of the 2008 global financial crisis. Even as the price tag kept increasing, the British government was discussing how to further reduce military spending, prompted by a new government which had inherited a budget deficit of about 12% of GDP. As Prime Minister Cameron's government came into power, they initiated an austerity plan to fix the UK's finances. This made it impossible to realign and refocus British military priorities, and complicated resolving a £38 billion overhang in the military equipment budget alone. The military equipment wishlist was heavily frowned upon and thought exorbitant. Given that the military itself had shrunk significantly from 220,000 in 1998 to about 102,000 by 2010, Cameron's government unleashed the Strategic Defense and Security Review, which was in effect a severe cost-cutting plan to gut the UK military. Under its guidance, the British Army shrank from 102,000 to 82,000, a 20% drop, and had 40% of its Challenger II tank fleet scrapped. Self-propelled artillery, much more expensive to equip and maintain than towed artillery, also got the axe, with Britain scrapping 35% of its inventory. Another victim was the Royal Navy's HMS Arc Royale, decommissioned in April 2011, which eliminated its entire naval air fleet arm. Its 72 Harriers were sold to the US Marine Corps for the bargain price of $180 million, a hell of a deal considering at the time of their acquisition the Harrier fleet would have cost the UK around $2 billion. With no carrier or maritime patrol capability of its own, Britain was forced to rely on its allies when it intervened in the first Libyan civil war. Operation Elemy was an attempt to prove that the UK was still a relevant European power, but it came at a severe cost as its military stockpile of precision weapons was seriously depleted and to this day they have not been fully replaced. Despite this, the British military continued to experience cuts. Military leadership began to grow quite vocal with their discontent, appearing on primetime news shows to voice concern about the readiness of the UK military. In response, they were promised a 1% increase in equipment purchases from 2015 to 2020. The government also made plans to increase total defense spending by 5% between 2020 and 2021 and cancel the round of equipment cuts to Britain's tank and artillery fleets. There were also plans to bring back Britain's carrier capabilities to the Royal Navy. And then, Brexit happened, hurling the British economy into turmoil. Following hot on its heels, the global COVID pandemic did its best to further ruin Britain's military reinvestment plans by dragging the global economy into the ditch. But then, the new Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced the largest investment in the Ministry of Defense since the Cold War, a four-year funding deal that would add $21.9 billion to the military's budget and would be geared at rearmament and replenishment. Despite this, though, Britain was still planning significant cuts to its standing forces, specifically its army and its fleet of armored vehicles. Then, barely a year later, Russia decided to invade Ukraine and Europe was shocked to discover that Russians had opted to resolve their problems with guns and artillery instead of the expected hugs. The economic disruption was global, and even more pressure was put on the UK military budget. Nonetheless, the UK has stepped up to the plate with $2.8 billion in military aid, over 200 armored vehicles, and 10,000 rounds of artillery ammunition. The real problem, though, is that the government currently has no means of backfilling everything that's been sent to Ukraine, prompting at least one MP to comment that the military could only fight for five days and then not defend the home islands from invasion. So how in the world would Britain aid its allies in a third world war? For decades after the Cold War, Britain figured that its role in any future conflict would be largely in the air and at sea, prompting its biggest budget cuts to fall squarely on the army. Its fleet of Challenger II main battle tanks has shrunk to 213 vehicles, but that fleet is facing even more cuts, down to just 148 Challenger Threes by 2030. But this won't be a new tank acquisition, but merely an upgrade program of its Challenger IIs. So, despite some increased capability, the overall program is a net loss for British ground forces. Given typical readiness rates of around 75%, by 2030 Britain might have just over 100 tanks ready for war at any given time. And even just half the loss rates of those experienced in Ukraine, Britain would be out of tanks within a month or two of fighting. Its 721 infantry fighting vehicles are facing the prospect of similar cuts as the Army transitions from the Warrior IFV to the Ajax IFV. It plans to acquire 539 Ajaxes by 2029, and it's almost certain that the total fleet will not return to even the 721 warriors currently in service. The nation has a pathetic artillery force mostly made up of 126 105mm howitzers. Significant reductions to its self-propelled guns has shrunk its force 
to just 89 155mm AS-90s, with 32 of those transferred to Ukraine. The transfers are expected to be replaced by the Swedish-built BAE Archer, which trades armor for mobility, and the UK already has 14 in service. The Archer is a stopgap purchase, though, as the Army figures out what vehicle will ultimately replace its AS-90 fleet. Its rocket artillery forces number at just 44 and are in the process of being upgraded to fire the American GMLRS Extended Range and Precision Strike Missile by 2025. To support its ground forces, the British Army has 44 attack helicopters, with two of these being upgraded Apache variants, the AH-64E. The fleet is actually expected to grow, however, with a total of 50 new helicopters on order to replace its aging fleet of license-built Apaches procured in 2004. The once legendary Royal Navy has suffered significant cuts as well. At sea, Britain operates four ballistic missile submarines as part of its nuclear triad, as well as six nuclear attack submarines. The old Trafalgar class is being retired, with the HMS Triumph slated to be decommissioned as soon as it's replaced with the new Astute class. Britain has plans to purchase seven of these nuclear-powered submarines, but as focus shifts to the Indo-Pacific and a war with China, more purchases are under consideration. However, given how long it takes to build ships and subs, it's likely already too late for any future purchases to do anything but replace combat losses. In 2017, the HMS Queen Elizabeth was commissioned, marking a triumphant return of the Royal Navy's aviation arm to the world's oceans. Now the UK operates two of the Queen Elizabeth-class aircraft carriers, with each carrying a maximum of 36 F-35s, along with support rotary aviation. The largest vessels ever built for the Royal Navy, they pale in comparison to the 75-90 to combat jets that a US supercarrier can field, and which China eventually hopes to match, but are a significant move back to becoming a significant naval power. The F-35 also gives the UK an outsized punch against any potential adversary, namely China or Russia, though the nation has been heavily criticized by the US after one of its former F-35 pilots was discovered to have been contracted as a consultant by the Chinese military. Its carriers are supported by six Type 45 destroyers, which are primarily equipped for an air defense role to protect friendly ships from enemy aircraft and missiles. These are supplemented by 11 Type 23 frigates, which while being guided missile frigates lack significant punching power against surface vessels. Instead, the Type 23s are optimized for anti-submarine warfare, leaving the anti-ship role largely up to its attack submarines or aircraft carriers. The Royal Air Force, meanwhile, finds itself in dire straits. Its air fleet has shrunk to just 137 Eurofighter Typhoons and 29 F-35s, which are jointly operated by its fleet air arm. This leaves the Royal Air Force with basically just the Typhoon, and those are already being scrapped with the fleet shrinking by the year. The RAF does have plans to procure between 60 to 80 total F-35s, though it'll be sharing about half of those with the Navy. The Tempest, now in development, is expected to make up the bulk of the Royal Air Force by replacing the current fleet of Typhoons, but given the history of the British arms procurement, the Royal Air Force's outlook is grim as it attempts to defend British interests with a fleet of less than 200 combat aircraft. To make matters worse, the RAF has no operational advanced early warning and control aircraft, with an order for five being reduced to just three and expected to be delivered in 2024. It does still maintain nine Poseidon anti-submarine and anti-ship aircraft, however, as would be expected given its duty to defend the UK-Greenland-Iceland line against Russian ships and submarines in case of war. So, how would the UK fight in a third world war with such an anemic military? Britain's role in a major future conflict would be relegated to a support role, a serious demotion from its frontline role in both world wars. In a European conflict, Britain's biggest contribution to NATO would be its role as an unsinkable aircraft carrier for American long-range strike aircraft. With no dedicated bombers of its own, and such a small air fleet of which only about half would ever realistically be operational at any one time, British fighters would be best used to ensure the skies over and around the British Isles remain safe for Allied aircraft, especially for big American bombers like the B-52. Its Navy's greatest contribution would be in securing the all-important UK-Greenland-Iceland line, a picket line stretching across the North Atlantic. Russian vessels would seek to cross this picket in order to attack American shipping in the Atlantic. Though, given the state of the Russian Navy today, only its submarine forces would pose any threat. These, Britain is well-suited to tracking and destroying, given its fleet of Poseidon aircraft and frigates. 
Britain would struggle to provide significant firepower for a land task force, and its forces would likely be relegated to a reserve force, to be held back and used in case of enemy breakthrough. As it would take weeks for Britain to fully meet its NATO commitments, its army would be important in relieving combat exhausted or depleted NATO forces from other nations. But lacking significant firepower, Britain's days as a frontline force are well in the past. As the next major global conflict is likely to occur in the Pacific against an increasingly belligerent China, Britain would be ever more hard-pressed to seriously support its American and Australian allies. However, a 2023 UK-Japan defense agreement has greatly increased ties between the two nations and allows for the deployment of their militaries within each other's nations. While small, a UK air or ground commitment in Japan would still be significant given its modern capabilities, and in a war over Taiwan, one can never have enough combat jets or ground-based air defenses protecting Japanese airfields. Its attack submarines could pose a significant headache for China, given their extreme stealth and lethality against a People's Liberation Army Navy that's still lagging significantly behind in anti-submarine warfare. Here, Britain's small undersea forces would have an outsized effect in helping the US and allies shut down Chinese shipping around Taiwan, though the strait itself is too shallow for safe operation of attack submarines. Of its two aircraft carriers, it's likely only one would be operational at any one time. But an additional, if smaller, carrier in the Pacific would be a significant boost to U.S. efforts to prevent a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Its days as a global military power are firmly behind it, and its military is in a state of crisis, but Britain can still provide significant assistance to any Allied effort in the next major war. In the end, it's exactly these allies that are Britain's greatest strength, though the nation must ask itself if it hasn't been overly reliant on both its nuclear arsenal and the power of its allies to guarantee its own security. The Korean War has never formally ended, and for North Korea, there's only one acceptable outcome – reunification under North leadership. Alarmingly, despite South Korea being protected by the might of the US military, it might be able to achieve this. North Korea views reunification not just as a matter of national pride, but of survival for the Kim regime. The situation in the North is bad, really bad. With even Pyongyang experiencing food shortages in recent years, the COVID pandemic also put a lot of pressure on the Kim regime. And as the South continues to prosper while the North stagnates, reunification by force may be the regime's last chance to stave off an insurrection. Standing in the way of reunification by force are about 600,000 South Korea troops and 50,000 American troops. The South fields a largely modern and capable military and has the explicit backing of the United States of America. Together, the two are a military juggernaut that the North can't hope to beat. Or could it? Because North Korea has some plans to either break this alliance or simply win before the US can bring its full might to bear. With over a million troops, North Korean forces outnumber the ROK's own by 300,000. Their equipment is outdated and the bulk of their armored forces consist of Soviet-era T-62s. By comparison, the South fields the mighty K-2 battle tank, a fully modern and extremely capable system. North Korea's air force is antiquated and largely a token force, and its navy has a little bit of a punch, but is outclassed by the South. But the North has one thing going for it, a massive concentration of artillery that the South can't counter. Artillery has become the saving grace of failed militaries around the world, and nowhere is this better displayed than in Ukraine. After Russia failed at combined arms operations, its best tanks were eviscerated by American and British anti-tank missiles, and its air force failed to suppress Ukrainian ground forces. It went back to the type of fighting it knew best, indiscriminate and overwhelming firepower via artillery. With as much as a 20 to 1 advantage over Ukraine, Russian artillery has been able to grind the war to a slow, steady grind and prevent an embarrassing all-out rout. North Korea's artillery may be old, but the beauty of artillery is that it doesn't have to be very modern to be extremely lethal, especially when you have a huge amount of it. And North Korea has one of the biggest artillery forces anywhere in the world. That's not on accident. The nation has an estimated 5,000 self-propelled artillery pieces alongside 5,000 towed howitzers. It's the second largest stock of each system anywhere in the world, outclassed only by Russia. Its multiple rocket launcher system fleet is the third largest on Earth, with nearly 3,000 of those systems in its arsenal. North Korean artillery doesn't even come close to modern American systems like precision-guided HIMARS or Excalibur-guided shells, but they don't have to. With thousands of guns ready to go at a moment's notice, precision becomes irrelevant when you overwhelm your enemy with huge volleys of saturation fire, and North Korea is prepared to do just that. In fact, they count on this artillery to secure victory in a new Korean war, 
and they have one massive trump card over the US and ROK alliance. The city of Seoul is one of the most modern and prosperous in the world. It's also within the range of North Korea's long-range artillery stationed along the DMZ. With several million inhabitants, Seoul has been the one weakness in every war plan developed by America and the ROK. Multiple times in the last 30 years, the United States has been prepared to launch strikes against North Korea to punish it for its nuclear program and to attempt to destroy it in place. Each time the South Koreans politely remind their American allies, their capital was directly in range of North Korean guns. To counter the artillery threat, Seoul has built a large underground bunker system where its citizens can hide out for days if need be. They also have deployed significant counter-battery systems along the DMZ, with artillery units specifically trained and tasked with responding to northern fire and destroying the North's guns. The South Korean and US Air Forces are both prepared for rapid response missions across the vast DMZ to eliminate northern batteries. But the North isn't ignorant to these plans, and it has its own in order to extend the survivability of its big guns. First, North Korea would immediately target Seoul with its longest-range guns. Equipped with incendiary munitions, the damage would be catastrophic, and not all civilians could hope to get to safety before the rounds started raining down around them. It's estimated that North Korea could deliver several thousand rounds in an hour to the city. Even with US ROK counter-battery fire, an estimated 40% of the city would be destroyed in the opening hours of a new war, leading to catastrophic economic damage for the South. Second, North Korea is guaranteed to use various chemical and possibly even biological agents in the opening hours of its attack. With a fleet of an estimated 600 Scud missile launchers, North Korea would target ports, train stations, and airports with chemical and biological weapons in order to paralyze the South's transportation networks. The aim would be to make escape impossible for South Korean citizens. Much like Russia, North Korea views civilians as a legitimate target for war and a way to force its enemy into concessions. Trapping South Korean citizens in Seoul and other major cities would be of greater strategic value to the North than destroying ROK military facilities themselves. The North would attempt to negotiate for peace under its own terms by holding South Korea's citizens hostage, or at the very least, would seek to limit US involvement. The United States would have to carefully weigh the global optics in its response to the North. If its involvement guarantees the death of hundreds of thousands or even millions of ROK citizens, it'll cost the US politically and might even erode public support for intervention back home. Next, chemical weapons with persistent agents that can last for days would be used against the ROK and US air bases near the DMZ. North Korean victory would rely on it quickly taking Seoul and then holding it hostage, forcing the South to sue for peace and the US to stay away by threatening the death of millions of Seoul civilians. However, the biggest threat to this plan is Allied air power, and thus it would be critical to shut down airfields near the DMZ quickly as possible to prevent rapid response strikes. Persistent agents delivered via ballistic missiles would ensure that airfields remain inoperable and aircraft themselves require extensive decontamination efforts. Allied air power would be forced to fly from airfields further to the south or even completely out of the country for the US significantly slowing mission sortie rates and response times. Shutting down Allied air power is of critical importance to the North, because the terrain leading from the North to the South is very difficult, and large offensives could only take place via half a dozen or so routes through the hills and mountains. This would create a dangerous bottleneck of forces, which could be devastated by superior air power. Much as we saw retreating Iraqi forces annihilated by the infamous Highway of Death leading out of Kuwait. But even with runways operational, the Allies might have trouble flying strike missions against northern forces. The DMZ is home to a very dense network of northern air defenses, and while these are largely old Soviet-era models, as we've seen in Ukraine weapons like the S-300, it's still a significant threat to modern aircraft. The United States has tools to operate in such highly contested environments, but this would force it to rely on the F-22, F-35, and B-2 stealth bomber. The B-2 is too few in number to stem the tide of northern forces and would already be tasked with delivering decapitation strikes against the Kim regime and destroying its nuclear weapons infrastructure. This would leave the F-22 and the F-35 to respond, and neither aircraft is capable of bringing the type of firepower needed to stop a million-strong army equipped with over 6,000 tanks. Sure, North Korean tanks might be relics, but they are still tanks, and there's 6,000 of them most of which would be surging towards Seoul or fixing southern forces to prevent them reinforcing the Seoul Axis. What the US and South Korea needs is the American B-52 bomber. This is the world's preeminent bomber aircraft, capable of bringing the pain in the form of 70,000 pounds of high explosives per aircraft. 
But it's the actual weapons that really matter here, and the United States Air Force has weapons specifically designed to devastate large armored formations. During the Second Gulf War, a single Marine recon platoon in unarmored Humvees ran into an entire Iraqi armored foundation. The Marines called in fire support from a loitering B-52, which dropped four CBU-97 cluster munitions. Inside each 1,000-pound bomb are 40 sensor-fused projectiles, known as skeets, which when dispersed over an area automatically target armored vehicles and destroy them from above. The Iraqi armored formation was immediately forced to retreat after losing approximately half of their vehicles in the first attack. These types of weapons which the US has in the thousands would devastate North Korean armored formations, but the United States would have to carefully weigh the costs. Without stealth, B-52s are nothing more than big bomb trucks and significantly threatened by even older ground-based air defenses. While B-52s in Vietnam showed they were able to deploy electronic countermeasures to dramatically increase their survivability and limit casualties while bombing the densest North Vietnamese air defense zones, the US would still have to carefully consider how much of its bomber fleet it's willing to sacrifice to try to stop Northern armor, and if it would be even able to bring enough aircraft to the fight to do so. That's why the US would be limited to flying missions from outside of South Korea, basing these mighty B-52s from Japan and Guam. This limits how many of the aircraft can be brought and stored in theater and dramatically lower sortie rates as the big bombers are forced to fly further. To further disrupt the Allies' response, North Korea would immediately deploy the largest special purpose forces in the world. With an estimated 60,000 special forces operators, Northern SOF would infiltrate the South in advance of any attack or immediately before one is launched. Dressed in civilian clothing or stolen ROK uniforms, North Korean special forces would conduct a massive campaign of sabotage and disruption significantly complicating a military response by the South. And North Korea has multiple ways of getting its special forces into the South, unseen even by sophisticated ROK and US surveillance tech. North Korea maintains a small fleet of biplanes. With canvas skin, these aircraft are throwbacks to World War I and of zero military threat to the South, except for one unique feature. Because they fly low, very slow, and have very few metal parts, these biplanes are incredibly difficult to locate and track with search radars, let alone target with modern air defense missiles. North Korean forces are trained to parachute out of these antiquated planes, and hundreds of them could probably manage the task even under cover of night. The second intrusion vector into the south would be via a fleet of many submarines that the North operates. Some of these are large enough to pose a threat to Allied ships, but many more are designed to take squads of soldiers past the 38th parallel and to the southern beaches. Operating in very shallow water, these small subs would basically be undetectable, and only vigorous beach patrols could hope to stop infiltration using these craft, diverting badly needed manpower from the war spilling across the DMZ. On the DMZ itself, though, North Korea has yet another infiltration vector, though it's not known just how active it remains today. Throughout the 90s, the ROK forces discovered multiple tunnels that the North had dug right under the DMZ. Some of these were big enough to allow for an estimated 3,200 soldiers to pour through them per hour, completely bypassing the dense defenses of the DMZ itself. Such a force could wreak havoc behind enemy lines, and while they would be largely engaging in suicide attacks, heavy indoctrination has prepared North Korean special forces for the sacrificial task. No new tunnels have been discovered since the 2000s, but that doesn't mean they haven't been built. Disruption is the name of the game for North Korea, and of its strategic goals in the invasion of the South, none is more important than knocking the US out of the fight and keeping it out. To achieve this, North Korea needs to shut down major southern ports, which would allow for the offloading of large amounts of American troops and equipment. The US could surge several thousand light infantry via its large air transport fleet, but bringing America's mighty armored division into the fight would require approximately 60 days. This would leave the North with just under two months to shut down the South's major ports. Normally, incoming reinforcements would be better intercepted at sea. North Korea does have a small fleet of diesel submarines, but these subs have short ranges and are not very sophisticated. They would be better used laying silently in ambush to attempt to intercept ROK and US naval forces pushing north past the DMZ to unleash volleys of cruise missile attacks. Even then, they would not survive for long up against both fleets' anti-submarine assets. Instead, North Korea would need to shut down the port facilities themselves. This is where the use of chemical weapons would once more come into play, with the aim of contaminating disembarking points for US troops. The US and South Korea have formidable air defenses, including the Patriot Air Defense System, but North Korea is prepared to launch massive volleys of ballistic missiles in order to overwhelm the southern air defense network. 
and amongst those incoming ballistic missiles would inevitably be multiple nuclear weapons. It's believed that by now the North has miniaturized its arsenal of a few dozen nuclear weapons, enough to load on medium-range missiles. It might even be able to threaten the west coast of the United States itself, but the North's nukes are better suited for knocking out port facilities and military airfields in the South. The Kim regime is likely fully prepared to do so, as there is no chance that the Kim family would survive a failed war. Not only do both the US and South Korea have decapitation strike plans in place, using bombers, cruise missiles, and special forces to eliminate the Kims on the onset of the war, but a failed war to reunify the South with the North could end up in catastrophic and apocalyptic defeat for the North. Many in the higher echelons of power in Pyongyang would eliminate the Kim regime long before American Abrams and South Korean K-2 tanks started rolling into the city. For North Korea, the outbreak of war is an all-or-nothing affair, with national survival at stake. The use of nuclear weapons is thus naturally assumed. Brazil may seem far removed from any truly global conflicts, but the most powerful South American country finds itself at a crossroads that could put it in the crosshairs of either the US or China in a third world war. How does Brazil plan to navigate a third world war, and what side would it find itself on? South America might seem too distant from Europe to have had any involvement in either world wars, but Brazil found itself caught up in the global conflicts anyway. During the First World War, Brazil supported Britain and its allies, helping patrol the waters of the South Atlantic and sending a small expeditionary force to the Western Front toward the end of the war. But in World War II, it found itself playing a larger role. When the war started, most might have assumed Brazil would throw its weight behind the allies once more. But Brazil had changed significantly in the two decades since the First World War. It was now Germany's ninth largest trading partner and had a significant population of Germans living inside its borders, all actively working to push Brazilian politics closer toward a pro-German agenda. When war broke out, Brazil remained neutral and traded with both sides. Slowly but surely, though, Brazil would be pulled toward the Allies, most notably with the creation of the Joint Brazil-US Defense Commission, which ostensibly had the goal of strengthening military ties between the two countries, but was largely focused on preventing the Axis powers from using Brazil as a naval base of operations to attack US shipping lanes in the Atlantic. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and the declaration of war by the US against the Axis powers, the US launched the Pan American States Conference in Rio de Janeiro. There, the US offered South American nations a deal, back us and cut ties with the Axis in exchange for economic assistance. Brazil agreed and quickly cut off ties with Germany, Japan, and Italy. In exchange for help developing its steel industry, Brazil agreed to let the US create air bases in the north of the country, with one of those bases becoming the largest overseas US base in the world. It also allowed the US Navy to station US Task Force 3 off its coast, with the goal of attacking submarines and enemy merchant shipping. With the US and China locking horns over the issue of Taiwan and South Pacific security, a third major war is now looming on the horizon, and Brazil might end up playing a small but critical role. Brazil would likely try to remain neutral once more, but inevitably both China and the US would put significant pressure on Brazil to pick a side. This may be more difficult than it was in either world war due to Brazil's numerous ties to both potential combatants. Today, China is Brazil's biggest trading partner, with China making up 31% of its exports and almost 23% of its imports. This is in comparison to the US's 11% of exports and almost 18% of imports. China is a big importer of Brazilian minerals, as the nation's roaring economy and prodigious building spree has consumed a significant amount of the world's steel and iron. But China's rate of construction has slowed significantly and is expected to continue slowing, as its economic boom cannot last forever. Thus, the amount of exports to China is likely also set to dwindle. In 2001, Brazil helped lead the charge for the formation of BRICS, a global trade organization made up of the emerging economies of Brazil, Russia, India, and China. In 2010, South Africa would join the group, and together the organization's goal was to build an alternative to the Western US-dominated global economic order by focusing on development in emerging economies. Today, Brazil remains committed to BRICS, but the organization itself is finding itself in increasingly shaky footing. Russia's disastrous war in Ukraine and China's increasingly aggressive threats toward Taiwan and its neighbors is forcing Brazil to rethink its continued partnership with the two nations that are quickly becoming global pariahs. The solidifying of the Western position against Russia and unexpected development from both the West and Russia showed the world that the West could truly be unified at a time when its rivals expected Western nations to largely seek their own self-serving agendas. Further adding to the tension is emerging rivalries within the organization itself. 
Chinese-Indian relations have steadily been deteriorating for decades, with full-blown border clashes between troops armed with clubs and riot batons leaving dozens dead. The anticipation of a military showdown with China has even prompted India to make the unprecedented step of moving closer toward a formal partnership with the US and its Pacific allies. Known as the Quad, the informal association of the US, Japan, India, and Australia has been meeting with increasing regularity to discuss a variety of Asian security concerns, and China is chief amongst all of those concerns. Russia and China also find their relationship under increasing strain. Despite claims of a no-limits partnership by Russia, China has quickly corrected the statement a year later by flatly stating that their partnership did in fact have hard limits. While it would seem a natural fit as both Russia and China face the exact same international rivalries and consider the Western liberal world order a threat to their own existence, or at least the existence of their authoritarian leaders, China and Russia have had their own host of issues that sour a potential partnership. The war in Ukraine has shown Russia to be fundamentally weak, and China has smelled blood in the water using Russia's waning influence to exert its own influence over Central Asian states as it seeks to secure supplies of oil, gas, and minerals from former Soviet republics. Russia sees this as a direct challenge to its own authority, considering nations like Kazakhstan to be firmly within its own sphere of influence. But Russia is living in the Soviet past, and today it's not even sure it can hang on to its own republics. The Russian Far East sees ever-increasing investments from Chinese companies, as well as an influx of both legal and illegal Chinese immigrants at a time that ethnic Russians will steadily migrate out of the area. In just a few years' time, the resource-rich Russian Far East will be far more Chinese than Russian, possibly prompting China to move toward a plan for annexation. China's Belt and Road Initiative also is posing a public perception risk for Brazil. Known as debt trap diplomacy, China is offering loans to countries it knows can't pay them back. To pay off some of the debts, China is simply given legal rights over major infrastructure in those countries, and these seaports and railways could one day be hosting Chinese ships and moving Chinese troops around. While Brazil might have once looked toward BRICS as an alternative to the Western financial order, BRICS may now be more of a liability than a benefit in an increasingly polarized world, and its relationship with the United States could suffer from it. Currently, Brazil and the US have a good relationship despite Brazil's inclusion in BRICS. The US and Brazilian military regularly train together, and in 2019 Brazil became a non-NATO US ally. The US provides Brazil with the direct assistance for counter-drug operations as well as environmental programs to help Brazil protect the biodiversity of its sprawling rainforests. The military relationship is what's of most importance though, and here the two nations enjoy robust cooperation, including joint research and development programs. Brazil also signed an agreement to allow the US to launch space assets from its Alcantara Space Center as well as signing the Artemis Accords in 2021, partnering with the US to establish a common civil governance for space exploration. However, despite this, the US-Brazil relationship has had its hiccups as of late. Brazil's new president, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, has been criticized for blaming the US and the West for provoking Russia into invading Ukraine by arming the nation. He's also been criticized for his encouragement of peace talks between Ukraine and Russia at a time when those peace talks would naturally favor Russia. In exchange, Russia's praised Brazil's president, and when you're on the receiving end of Russian praise, you really need to check your place in history. The US responded by claiming that Lula is simply parroting Russian and Chinese propaganda, and he is met with increasing scorn when he demanded that the West stop providing Ukraine with arms altogether. This would naturally lead to a complete collapse of the Ukrainian military, and with statements like that, one has to ask which side of the conflict does Brazil truly stand on, and just how much longer will the US and Brazil remain allies? It's no secret that China has attempted to increase its influence in South America in order to complicate the US geopolitical position, and to say that America is taking this lightly would be an understatement. But if China could move Brazil away from the US, it would be a significant political victory, especially if China could gain basing rights for navy and military inside Brazil itself. So, what would Brazil's World War III plan look like? That might depend on which side of the conflict South America's greatest military power found itself. Brazil is strategically important, as it sits astride some of the largest trade arteries in the world, and from Brazil's coasts, a joint naval air force could seriously complicate the South Atlantic trade for either side. However, for China, a partnership with Brazil could allow it to move air and naval assets out of the South China Sea and into the Atlantic, from where they could harass US trade. Chinese H-6 bombers flying from Brazil could strike at US oil infrastructure in the Gulf of Mexico and even launch standoff attacks against the American mainland itself, 
something that hasn't happened since the War of 1812. Currently, America's greatest strength in any conflict is its ability to keep any adversary at arm's length. The US is the boxer with the longest arms in the world, and it can be difficult to defeat a military power whose basic infrastructure or even global trade is basically untouchable. China might be able to sink much of the US Pacific Fleet, but it can't touch US shipyards building new ships, and it can't project power far enough to cut off US global trade. But a close Brazilian-Chinese partnership could change all of that and put the US on the back foot for the first time in two centuries. Brazil, however, would be risking a great deal directly allying itself with China in case of a global war for very little gain. The last thing Brazil wants is to pick a fight with its much bigger, more capable northern neighbor, whom, even if it is distracted by a war in the Pacific, would still have enough firepower to make Brazil regret its decision. With around 120 vessels, the Brazilian Navy is a significant force, though it's best suited for power projection in its immediate geographic vicinity. It has six diesel submarines, which lack the endurance to truly assist its current ally, the US, in any conflict far away in the Pacific. Its eight large surface combat vessels, six of which are frigates, and two corvettes, are also best suited for local operations rather than supporting an expeditionary effort, though it wouldn't be the first time Brazilian ships have sailed far from home ports. With the retirement of its one aircraft carrier, Brazil lacks the ability to launch sorties far from home, but it could still put its considerable naval weight into assisting its US ally in interdicting Chinese shipping along the South Atlantic, with the Suez Canal becoming a choke point where Chinese ships could easily be intercepted after exiting into the Mediterranean, routes traveling closer to Africa's western coast might be more favorable, and this is where Brazil's navy could come into play. No doubt, taking lessons from Russia's vast experience and sanction-busting, Chinese vessels would seek to evade sanctions by flying under false colors or using other underhanded techniques, and Brazilian ships dedicated to the task of sniffing out these sanction-busting ships would free up the US Navy for kinetic fighting in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Likewise, Brazil's air force is poorly suited for anything but local defensive operations. Currently, it has a fleet of 42 American F-5 fighters, a light fighter aircraft best suited for defense. Its 46 AMX attack aircraft are excellent for providing close air support over uncontested skies, but lack the endurance to assist a US-led effort against invading Chinese troops in Taiwan and would likely be destroyed if they face the Chinese Air Force. Its small fleet of five Swedish Gripens, with 27 more on order, are likewise more of a defensive than offensive aircraft with limited range and limited payload, and of no use in a Pacific scenario. Brazil's armed forces are significant, but any war against China will feature very little ground combat by those on the US's side. Simply put, it would be too difficult to put Allied troops on Taiwan without utterly decimating the Chinese Navy and Air Force, at which point there would be no need for ground troops as Allied naval and air power cuts off invaders from resupply and pounds them mercilessly from above and afar. Currently, Brazil's role in a third world war would be as a guarantor of regional security and unless something dramatically changes in the Brazil-US relationship, Brazil would be best put to use helping interdict Chinese shipping in the South Atlantic. However, all this could change significantly if Brazil were to swing completely into the Chinese camp, to the point of allowing the basing of Chinese forces off its own soil, but that would require such a dramatic change in current reality as to be bordering on pure fiction. If it were to pass though, Brazil's land forces could be called upon as there's no chance the US would tolerate a significant Chinese military presence in its own backyard. The US historically can be kind to its friends, but is absolutely merciless against anybody that threatens American security in its own hemisphere. Now go check out France's World War III plan or click this other video instead.